Thank you, my lady. Assessor. Indeed. Um, may I call Professor Catherine Noakes? Good afternoon. Why do you solemnly? I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Professor Noakes. As you will see, we've got a, a stenographer um, in the hearing room, and so if we can keep our answers um, at a reasonable pace, and if we're going too fast, it will be my fault, and I'll ask you just to slow down. And if you can keep your voice up so that everybody can hear. And um, Professor Noakes, you very helpfully um, prepared a witness statement for the inquiry. That's dated the 20th of July of 2023, and it's just been brought up at INQ 0002362661. Um, runs from page one through to page 89. It's a, sub a, sub a substantial piece of work, and it's um, accompanied by a declaration of truth. Is that right? That's correct. Um, you will appreciate that um, we have a limited amount of time, sadly, to go through some of your evidence, um, as we do with all witnesses. We, we simply won't be able to go through every aspect of your witness statement. But what I do hope to do today is to pull out the most pertinent aspects as we see them within module two. So what I propose to do is to take you through your involvement in both SAGE, some of the working groups that were set up, and then specifically to deal with your expertise in the areas of transmission um, in terms of the virus. So if I can just set the background for that, you are a Professor of Environmental Engineering in the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Leeds. Yes, I, I'm actually Environmental Engineering for Buildings. For Buildings, thank you. Um, you've, your background is, in, is as a chartered mechanical engineer, is that right? With That's correct. And in fluid dynamics as yes. a specialist. In. Now, you were um, a participant in SAGE, um, but your involvement went much further than that, and you were subsequently made the co-chair of a newly formed group. Yes. Is that right? That's correct. So I just want to go through how that came about very briefly. So, on the 7th of April of 2020, you were contacted by SAGE, is that right? That's correct, yes. And what were you asked to do? So, I was asked initially to provide a, a paper um, that gave some information on the environmental routes of transmission and the current knowledge at that time. And then I was also, in, it was indicated to me at that time that they were interested in setting up a subgroup and I might be asked to lead that subgroup. Indeed, and so you prepared that paper with the assistance of your colleagues at that point because of the urgency and the proximity of, yes, the, that's next, correct. of the next SAGE meeting where it was to be presented. And indeed, you attended that, that subsequent SAGE meeting on the 14th of April yes. 2020. And it was at that point that you were asked to set up what subsequently became the Environment and Modelling Group, is that right? That's correct, yes. And that's um, typically known by, its ac by an acronym. We have many acronyms here, but EMG. EMG, that's correct. Um, with regard to SAGE, you continued to attend meetings. I think you attended a total of 71. Yes, I did. In the period that you were in, a member. And indeed, as we've already um, alluded to, you became the, the chair um, of EMG. Yes. Now, just dealing with the remit of EMG in a nutshell, how would you describe it? So I would describe it as we focused on how the virus transmits from person to person and the role that the environment plays in that. And then we also focused on the mitigations we could apply. But we focused more on the local mitigations, things like uh, face masks, distancing, ventilation, hand hygiene, rather than the big ticket items like lockdowns or work from home. Indeed. I'm going to come on and ask you about those um, but firstly about methods of transmission and then secondly about mitigations and how they interrelate. Um, but before I do that very briefly, um, EMG was a new group. Yes, it was. It, it, so it didn't exist pre-pandemic and indeed it, it no longer exists. Is that right? That's correct, yes. So we, we were asked to form this group and had to find a bunch of experts to create that group in under a week. Indeed. And you set out in detail within your statement, I'm not going to take you there or go through it now, the challenges um, that you faced in setting up a group and the implications that had for diversity. And those mirror themes that we've already heard from, from other witnesses, and that's why I won't go, go through those in detail yes. now. Um, but dealing with the demand for your group's expertise, 
Um, that was predominantly, it's fair to say, in the, at the outset of the pandemic and through to the end of 2020, is that right? That's correct, yes. And what was the position in 2021? How did that differ? So by 2021, I think we had a lot more of the, the baseline knowledge around transmission, and it was therefore much more around application. Um, and I think some of the work we did in 2021 sort of fed into the ways in which we could release from the, the winter lockdown and to safely manage that. We did also consider when new variants came along um, what the implications of that might be for whether routes of transmission changed or became more prominent. Thank you. Um, I think you describe it in your statement, it's at paragraph 5.43 for those following, as a limbo period in short, 2021, before then coming back into looking at the roadmap out of lockdown. Yes, it, I, would, I would agree with that. It, there was a period where we weren't... We still had a few commissions, but it was much slower, and we were not quite sure how much longer we would remain as a group. Thank you. I want to just touch upon one challenge that you face within the EMG in relation to commissioning, um, and a very specific point, if I may. Um, in, in the earlier stages, stages of the pandemic, you received a question about the application of um, triethylene glycol, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, as a method of mitigating airborne transmission. How did that come about? Yes, yeah, so that particular one um, came about not as a commission to EMG, but actually as a, a question from an advisor in number 10. Um, I believe that's correct. Um, and they, it, it therefore came as an email. And one of the challenges with that one was that that came with some external people tagged into that email who then said, well, we have this technology, would you like to sign a non-disclosure agreement? Which my, I said, no. <laughs> and um, why was that in relation to a non-disclosure agreement? Um, because I felt, as a co-chair of EMG, that we should focus our evidence on peer-reviewed scientific evidence, the, the, the scientific evidence that was in preprints, and information from reputable laboratories, national laboratories, etc., rather than companies who were trying to sell products. And the, challenge, and the difficulty there was, of course, they'd been copied into the email chain, and so that took up some, some of your time, it's fair it, to say, in dealing with those um, requests and continued yes. requests. It, it did indeed, and it meant we had to put information into a paper that we wouldn't have ordinar ordinarily have done so and respond to those requests. So, and I think it's worth saying that triethylene glycol was never really going to be considered as a viable option because the idea of putting something into the air to try and clean the air, but you're putting a chemical into the air, you're just creating a new contaminant. Now, as the, as the um, pandemic progressed, a number of subgroups were set up under the auspices of both EMG and indeed you participated in a broader range of subgroups in relation to other SAGE mechanisms, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and I'll just run through those very quickly with you. The healthcare onset COVID working group, social care working group, um, a number of task and finish groups. You were also present at some SPI-B meetings and indeed also go science and, and coordination meetings, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And I went to the majority of those because I had very specific um, expertise around transmission and the engineering knowledge that was perhaps not present in those other groups. And we also see within EMG quite a broad range of other individuals from different um, SAGE groups and indeed non-SAGE groups such as NERVTAG at in attendance. Yes, and we, when we set it up, we deliberately co-opted people from those other subgroups so we could retain, make sure we kept those connections across the different subgroups. Indeed. Thank you. Now, what I want to go to next, if I may, is the issue of transmission and how the um, scientific evidence um, and understanding evolved over the period of the pandemic. Um, to do so, may I just firstly deal with the various routes of transmission? Um, we see that there is fomite transmission, airborne transmission, sometimes known as aerosol transmission, and droplet transmission. 
Now, for the assistance of all of us, if I can just run you through what each of those actually means. So, fomite. OK, so fomite transmission refers to... A fomite is an object, so it refers to transmission that would happen if, say, a surface or an object was contaminated, somebody touched that object with their hand, and then they subsequently touched their mucous membrane, so their eyes, nose or mouth. Okay. And airborne? So airborne transmission, or as you said, aerosol, refers to when there are very small particles containing the virus. These get emitted when we, through our respiratory activities, and these are the particles that can remain in the air and travel over some distance. Often airborne is used to describe longer range transmission, so to the other side of a room, um, but actually, it also happens when you're close to somebody because those small aerosols are also present at close range. They don't just sort of magically get to the far distance. So effectively, small droplets, don't, things don't get smaller as they go further away. They necessarily. Do, they do a they little do. bit, but that, they evaporate. But that evaporation happens really very quickly. It happens in less than a second. Thank so, you. Yeah. And then droplet. So droplet transmission is... This is a slightly more tricky one because it tends... Most people think of it as it refers to large droplets, almost like the spit droplets, that then behave like a ball ballistically and deposit out on surfaces very close by. Now, in um, traditional sort of infection control in healthcare, droplets are defined as particles that are above five microns in diameter. And that's not correct, because a 5 micron diameter or 10 micron diameter particle can stay in the air and go to the other side of the room. So there are actually some, some um, incorrect definitions used to define the difference between droplets and aerosols that are used very commonly in um, infection control literature. So it's not, a, it's not an easy um, distinction necessarily to make owing to those differences in interpretation. Correct. It's not an easy distinction to make, and there's no sort of single cut-off between a droplet and an aerosol, we actually all breathe out all of the different sizes of particles. It's not a sort of... There's no, no single... Not a cut-off you can put in there. Does it make a diff... Do you need to distinguish between them? Or if you're trying to combat them, supposing you have aerosol transmission, does it make a difference if you're trying to combat droplet transmission? So in some senses perhaps you don't but actually where it becomes an issue is the sizes of these particles because if you believe everything that happens when you're close to somebody is droplets then for example you won't take precautions that require masks that will filter out the aerosols so if if people are just wearing a, a simple face mask or a face shield which may deal with splashes and l very large droplets those won't filter out the small aerosols that are quite likely to also be present at close range. I follow. Thank, Thank you. you. So the implications essentially for infection control therefore go to barriers or things that you can put in place to mitigate yeah. aerosols as, alongside droplets. Yes. So you, you need to think about both of them at both short distance and longer distances. Okay. And in terms of understanding the transmission of COVID-19... Um, what was the initial understanding at the outset of the pandemic in relation to the, the nature of the transmission? So I think as a new disease, it's quite hard to, to... It was quite hard to have any good evidence. We were very much reliant on very early information coming out uh, and papers that were starting to come out from... Um, initially from China and then from other countries as, as that data grew. Um, it was fairly clear from early stages that there was uh, it was res transmitted through a respiratory route um, but an awful lot of the focus to start with was on droplets and washing your hands and surfaces the fomites rather than aerosols okay. Thank you. and were you concerned that the airborne transmission routes in terms of aerosols were being overlooked to some extent yes i was and how did, the, how did knowledge develop in the initial period of the pandemic from April in your involvement onwards? So in the initial period of the pandemic, there's, um, we drew on um, evidence from previous uh, respiratory 
diseases, including influenza and other coronaviruses, things like SARS. Um, we drew on our understanding of the basic physics of how aerosols behave and our understanding of how viruses can be carried in those, so there is some science in there. And then as, as the evidence progressed, we, we could see signals in epidemiological data that allowed sort of more understanding of transmission. So we started to see really quite early on that the vast majority of transmission happened indoors rather than outdoors, which starts to give you an indication that the environment matters and that how people interact together matters. You also... I think Couldn't we also... Just slow down, could you? Apologies. I'm conscious now. <laughs> it's not me. I can keep out when I'm not making a full note, unlike our stenographer. Apologies. Um... I think that... Um, so I interrupted you. Uh, <laughs> it's also apparent... Indication the environment matters and how people interact yeah. together matters. Yeah, it was also apparent that a lot of transmission happened when people were in fairly close proximity. The other thing that we started to see in perhaps February and into March 2020 was there were what we might term super-spreading events. So where you have a large number of people infected in a short period of time associated with a single event. And that perhaps is a bit of a red flag for airborne transmission. Okay, thank you. And just in terms of those super spreader events, can you give any examples of those? So there, was, there were a number that were reported in the um, early on, but there was, uh, there was a restaurant in uh, Guangzhou in China where there were people who, uh, people who were infected who were more than two metres apart. Um, there was a, quite a famous one called the Skagit Choral Society, which was a choir in America. And again, it was a very high number of people. I think it was 87% of the people there had, were infected um, in a single two-hour activity. Thank you. And as you say, that causes um, a number of red flags to go up in terms of looking at transmission routes. Um, but can I just ask you a little bit about um, the more global picture and the understanding by other organisations? On the 29th of March of 2020, the World Health Organisation published a tweet um, stating that COVID-19 was not airborne. Did that cause concern? I, I think it did. It, I, I was concerned by it and I'm aware that other people were concerned by that as well. And indeed, in your statement, you explained that, that prompted the formation of, of a group that came to be known as Group 36, and that's 36 experts in transmission, essentially. Yes, so this were 36 scientists from all around the world who had expertise and had worked in this area prior to the pandemic. And indeed, um, you and, and those individuals signed a petition that was then sent to the World Health Organization um, very quickly thereafter on the 2nd of April of 2020. Yes. Um, I, if, if you forgive me just for summarising, you followed that up with a letter when it, when it was effectively fell on deaf ears initially, is that yes, right? Yes, that's correct. And following on from that, articles, and as you explain, at paragraph 10.8, Eight, that prompted um, both media attention and started to change the, the discussion that took place around airborne transmission. Is that right? Yes, that, that's correct. Um, why do you think there was a reluctance to acknowledge the potential for airborne transmission? So it's, it's hard to be sure, um, but my personal opinions are there may be a number of reasons. So I think it's... It, there's, a, there's something about changing an accepted paradigm. If you know, traditionally, the, the respiratory diseases have often been categorised as droplet, and to change what people's uh, accepted views are is can be difficult, especially if they feel that that challenge is coming from a different different field, different area aspect of it. Um, I think mitigating airborne transmission is more challenging because it involves dealing with the environment. Every environment's different. And it's not as easy to put a simple rule, like washing your hands. It also takes the responsibility from the individual to the organisation, because it's the organisation that tends to deal with the environment, whereas it's the individual who perhaps washes their hands. 
Um, and I think I know to my statement as well that it's possible there may be a fear aspect to it. Um, and you can see this in, in movies and things where it goes airborne, promotes a fear. Now, I don't know whether that really was the case, did happen, but I think that may possibly play into it as well. Okay. And you also touch upon um, implications for hospital infection control. What implications would those be? Yes, so in, in hospital infection control, um, you know, which is, is a very good field, there are a lot of really expert people who do hospital infection control, but conventionally, if something is deemed droplet transmission, then you have relatively simple precautions. You perhaps put somebody in a side room, you maintain a distance, and you would wear relatively straightforward PPE, a simple surgical mask, maybe a visor. If something is deemed airborne, then providing you've got the capacity to do it, ideally you put that person into a negative pressure isolation room and you wear full um, respiratory protective equipment to manage that person. And certainly at the very outset of the pandemic, we'll all recall those images of people in those sorts of, um, yes. those sorts of um, mitigating outfits and so on. Um, in terms of EMG, it was obviously not established until April 2020, but in your view, was there an evidence base sufficient to operate on the precautionary principle through January through to March of 2020? I think there was, um, and I believe that prior to my involvement in SAGE that nerve tag had indicated the potential for airborne transmission. And to your knowledge, were there, were there any reasons not to take steps to guard against airborne transmission? I don't see that there were, no. I think, it, I think there was, although the evidence at the outset was weak, um, in truth it was weak for all transmission routes. I think there was just a tendency to assume the other transmission routes and then require the evidence for airborne transmission. So I think from a precautionary basis it would have been appropriate to indicate that, that aspects like ventilation mattered early on. And as that evidence base built, it was important that, that those mitigations were more readily um, applied and people became more, sh should have been made more aware of them. If I may move now through um, spring, summer of 2020, um, in short, there were a number of papers that were published and you were gathering, still gathering the evidence. Is that a fair summary? That's a fair summary, and I, I, an awful lot of research happened during the pandemic, um, which you know, we, we spent a lot of time sifting that information to put together. Now, come autumn 2020, did you, did you still have concerns or, in terms of airborne transmission being taken seriously, or did you consider that enough was being done? Yes, I did. And one of the concerns which I think you will have identified that I raised in my statement was that the publicly available information that's on the websites of the um, Public Health England, as it was then, and the NHS, for members of the public who maybe are trying to find information about how to manage the, the illness if you know, they have a case in their home, that all still focused on droplets and surfaces and didn't mention airborne. So I emailed uh, Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty um, in September to say, um, I'm concerned that this information, that we, you know, the evidence base that we've been collecting and discussing and agreeing is not feeding into this guideline. Did you get a positive response? So... In one sense, yes. I believe um, Chris Whitty sent the e emails on to um, Public Health England. They actually responded very quickly. They changed the information on their website. And indeed, they, in pr the process of doing that, they shared it with me. And we, I helped them put some forms of words together to describe what we knew about transmission. The NHS, on the other hand, nothing changed. And I believe I raised it in February and then again at a SAGE meeting in June 2021. And finally, a few weeks after that, their web pages were changed. Okay. So quite some time later. Quite some time later, yes. Now, you described that period of autumn of 2020 as being 
the most frustrating period and for you during the pandemic. Why was that? I think it was because we could see cases were rising. Um, we could see there was a desire to try and get back to normal, which is, is understandable. We can't stay in a lockdown forever and that's totally inappropriate. But I think it was that seeing cases rising and not very much being really done to try to mitigate them, even when people were interacting together. Now, your frustrations were such that you spoke to the press, is that right? Yes, so I spoke to the press on many occasions through the pandemic. Almost all of them were to talk about the science of transmission. On that one occasion, I expressed a frustration with um, feeling that the mitigations that were being um, put in place, I think it was a curfew at 10 o'clock in a pub, that I, it was not going to make any difference. Indeed. And that was an article in the, there was an article in the Financial Times in that That's respect. Correct, yes. Um, the 23rd of September. And then subsequently you posted a tweet um, in October of 2020. And I'm just going to ask for that to be pulled up, if I may. It's INQ 00019275. We see that um, here. It's dated the 13th of October of 2020. It's 1.56 p.m., so the afternoon. It's a cartoon. If we just run through that, um, it's, a, it's a cartoon. We see the first, it goes from left to right, obviously, first cartoon. Here's the situation. We see a graph. The line is here, but it's going upward towards here, effectively pointing towards bad, going from good to bad. And then... Uh, conversation between three individuals so things will be bad unless someone does something to stop it will anyone do that we don't know that's why we're showing you this i.e the graph so you don't know and the graph says things are not bad response but if no one acts they'll become bad well please let me know if that happens and as we see based on this conversation it already has so why did you send that tweet so I don't really recall my exact feelings at the time, but I, I think it was very much that frustration that we could see almost a repeat of what, was, what had happened the previous winter, um, that cases were rising, and it was almost a case of we had to wait for something really bad to happen before something did about it. I think it's also fair to say maybe I felt this applied to other things as well, such as climate change. When you refer to the previous winter, that's the January to March period yes. of 2020. Yes. Thank you. And then if I can just take you briefly to, through winter 2020 to 2021. And that was when we saw the emergence of the alpha variant yes. and cases rising. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Now, what, what implications did the alpha variant have in terms of transmissibility? So the... Uh, the initial indications which proved to be correct were that the alpha variant was more transmissible. So and when something is more transmissible, that means that the risk from any of your transmission routes increases. But our one concern there was that potentially the airborne route be could become more significant. So if you imagine at close range, you might have already crossed a threshold whereby transmission happens. So if it's more transmissible, it doesn't make that much more difference. But if before you'd not very much, you'd not crossed that threshold for airborne transmission to happen, but now perhaps you needed to breathe in slightly less of it, or perhaps more virus was being emitted, it could become uh, a more important route of transmission. Thank you. I just want to deal now, if I may, with um, the implications for physical distancing and the one to two metre rule specifically. Um, with regard to that, can you help us with the evidence behind what was the one to two metre rule? So I don't know the evidence that was behind its original um, design. Uh, that, was, that was before I'd involved in SAGE. One, it was one of the very first things EMG were asked to look at. Um, and we looked at where there might be epidemiological evidence. There is very little of that. 
and then we looked at where there are those evidence from the understanding of the physics of how particles behave and different sizes of particles over distances. And we drew together from what limited evidence there was to indicate that actually, yes, this sort of one and a half to two metres is where things are. I'm not sure I'd see, even now I'd go so far as to say safe, but where the risk starts to drop off. Thank you. Now, during spring of um, 2020, there was a lot of focus on the two metre rule and it caused a lot of controversy. Um, there was a lot of pressure to reduce that. And in terms of your work, do you recall a situation where a line from one of your reports was relied upon in furtherance of, of, of promoting a reduction from that two metre rule? Yes. So in, in May 2020, I was asked to give evidence to a select committee. I'm not going to ask you about your evidence okay. or anything in relation to the not select committee. To. OK. <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> um, but what I am interested in is that following yes. on from that, following a letter on from was that, sent yes. um, by Greg Clark, um, MP, the chair of that committee, um, referencing your work and pulling out a line from one of your reports. Was that an appropriate use of that line from the report? Uh, no, it wasn't, because he'd taken the line from the report. Um, it's actually the paper from the 28th of April, and it's paragraph 44 in that paper. Um, and he'd taken one line from it. The second sentence said, however, and described the fact that actually this, this model that we'd, we'd referred to had quite significant limitations. So, essentially, it was using one part of a paragraph, but not the rest of that paragraph. Sounds like a West End review. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was on the 29th of May 2020. Um, in June and July of 2020, with regard to decision-making and the response in terms of mitigations, um, there was quite significant movement in relation to social distancing, the opening up of restaurants, and so on and so forth. Um, was that in accordance with the scientific principles that you've, you've considered and looked at and the evidence base in relation to distancing? A lot of it was because that two-metre rule did remain. Um, and I think it's worth saying the two-metre rule doesn't just describe about your distance from somebody. It actually sets the principles of how many people can go into a different in a particular setting. So the more people there are in a setting the higher those risks go. And if I can just ask you specifically about the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, how does that fit with your understanding of transmission at that time? Okay, so just to clarify, EMG were not asked mm. to consider it. Um, had we been asked, I think we would have had a concern that encouraging people to get together indoors and only on perhaps three days of the week, which perhaps encourages crowding, um, was not necessarily a well-designed um, approach. And just to round off the two-metre rule, um, you, you've already explained why it's, that it's not a hard and fast rule. Lots of variables yeah. apply to that. Um, but it's still your view that that was not over-precautionary at the time. That's, that's correct. And indeed, many other countries who did have shorter distances had implemented other measures to allow them to go shorter distances, particularly face coverings, which we didn't have at the time in the UK. Thank you. Um, face masks have already been dealt um, with by, um, by Professor Horby, so I'm not going to ask you to deal with that today. But if I can just ask you very briefly to touch upon fomite transmission and the mitigations there. You've already referenced the, the hand-washing campaigns that we're all so familiar with, with the happy birthday and, and various other things in that, in that respect. Um, but in terms of broader challenges in relation to surfaces, what were those? So there was, um, I mean, I guess any surfaces which are contaminated, there's a potential risk there. Um, so we're thinking around cleaning of those surfaces. But I think although that was a, a key focus early on in the pandemic, um, really the evidence base to show that hand hygiene and cleaning surfaces reduces transmission for COVID-19 has not grown. I have yet to see evidence that suggests that it plays a, 
a major role. At the same time, I don't believe we can dismiss it, and I think we should have a certain amount of precaution there. Thank you. And then final topic, please, um, from me today, and that is um, the role of socioeconomic inequalities. And if I can just touch upon some of the work that was undertaken by you and ask you just to expand on that a little bit. You explained in, in one of your papers from EMG that um, previous research from the swine flu pandemic, um, so really contextualising this for a moment, um, demonstrated that social distancing was effective in reducing infections, but it was most um, pronounced in households with greater socioeconomic advantage. And you explained that similar findings were emerging for COVID-19. Um, why is that? What, what implications do, does socioeconomic situation have on the ability to practice social distancing? So I, I, this was something that was increasingly discussed in, in the papers that we produced because we became more and more aware of those uh, inequalities. And in the example you gave there around housing, um, obviously those who perhaps are more wealthy are more likely to have larger houses. They're more likely to be able to have a spare bedroom for somebody to isolate in. And they tend to be slightly smaller households. If you have um, people who are living in um, multi-generational households, they are more crowded. It's very hard if somebody's sick to, to isolate or if, for example, if somebody is working in a higher risk occupation and doesn't want to put their household members at risk. It's much more challenging. Indeed, and you also refer to other aspects such as, such as occupation, um, transport to and from work, yes. those sorts of issues as well. Um, thank you very much, Professor Noakes, but if you just pause there, there are some questions. Mike. Just before we move to, I think it's Ms Shepherd who's going to be asking questions, can I ask you about mass gatherings, Professor yes. Noakes? Um, given what you've said, where, where do you stand on... I, I think I've heard evidence that suggested mass gatherings don't of themselves create a greater risk because you're only going to infect the people around you. How, how does that fit with your...? Yes, so that, that's, that's, that's true. So actually a mass gathering, let's say you go to a football match, um, it's unlikely that you're going to have transmission from somebody who's sat at the other side of the pitch to you. It's more likely to happen very close to you. Um, I think what where mass gatherings perhaps do pose a risk is that people travel to them. So they will travel in coaches or um, all together. So th there's risks in there. They will perhaps stay overnight in places. They will perhaps, as part of that, go and visit pubs and restaurants. So it's the it's it's likely to be the activities alongside the mass gathering that pose more risk than the mass gathering. Perhaps the only slightly different one there is something like a wedding which is a, a smaller gathering but they were associated weddings and parties were associated with quite high transmission and i think because there are lots of people mingle with lots of other people thank you yes miss miss shepherd good morning professor noakes i appear on behalf of covid19 briefed families for justice cymru and my questions were focused on the devolved administration angle. So firstly, did you and your colleagues on the environmental modelling group feel that you had an understanding of how your advice would be used by the devolved administrations? So we didn't have a full understanding because, as I say, we, we were producing advice papers for SAGE and therefore the, the routes for them to actually get to devolved nations were largely via SAGE. However, I think it's worth noting that on our group, we, we had representation, active representation from NHS Scotland and Public Health Scotland on the group. Um, we did also have observers, as did many of the subgroups, from the devolved nations, so they would hear the discussions that we were having. Did you receive any data from the devolved administrations? Uh, I don't recall, um, but as a group, we didn't deal with significant amounts of data. It was many of the other subgroups who dealt with, particularly SPY-M, who dealt with data more than us. And did you, did you and your colleagues consider that you had a clear understanding of where the dividing line was 
in terms of your responsibility to provide advice to the whole U of the UK and the responsibility of the scientific advisers to the devolved administrations to provide advice which concerned their nation specifically? Um, I think we... Most of the advice we gave was, I guess, agnostic to a particular nation. So we were giving advice around things like, you know, ventilation or distancing. Um, and therefore, really how that advice is acted on is, the dis is up to the policymakers in those nations to, to take on and use. Thank you, Professor Nix, and thank you, Milady. Thank you, Ms. Shepherd. Uh, that, I think, completes the questions for you, Professor Noakes. Thank you very much indeed. Until I started this inquiry, I confess I didn't realise the extent to which your kind of expertise and skills were required and utilised during the pandemic response, and um, I should have known. And I'm really grateful to you, obviously, unsung heroines and heroes. Thank you. Thank you. The next witness is Professor John Edmonds. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Professor, could you commence your evidence, please, by giving the inquiry your full name? Uh, Professor John Edmonds. Professor Edmonds, you have kindly provided a substantial witness statement, 273553. We have it there on the screen. We can see from the bottom of the first page that that page is page one of 115, in fact, and it's a statement that you signed certified as being true on the 30th of August, 2023. Is that correct? Yes. Y you are... an expert in infectious disease modelling, in pandemic planning, by extension, and, and also by virtue of, of your particular expertise, a de facto expert in, in, in epidemiology. You are the Chair in Infectious Disease Modelling at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I am. And have you been involved in pandemic planning in, in, at the United Kingdom level for many years? Yes. Were you the head of the Modelling and Economics Unit at the Health Protection Agency? Is that the body now known as the UKHSA? Yes, and it is, yes. And, and were you therefore, in fact, one of the first members of SPY M? I was, yes. Of which we've had much. It's the scientific pandemic influenza group on modelling, of course. You left the Health Protection Agency in June 2008 when you took up your chair at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. But did you carry on working on in particular, pandemic influenza. I did, yes. Influenza pandemics. Um, over the years, whilst you were still serving on SPY-M, and, and were you at the forefront of, of the expert field of modelling and epidemiology in relation to epidemics both in the United Kingdom and abroad? 
Yes, I suppose you want me to say, but yes, sir. All right. You were also a member of NerveTag, and you, I think, joined NerveTag in 2014, and you served on that committee from 2014 through to 2022. And so when we confronted the pandemic in the United Kingdom, you continued to serve on, on all those committees. I think you attended 97 SAGE meetings, 99 SPY MO meetings, and 91 other subgroup or related meetings. As far as I could ascertain, yes. And, and I think in addition, 74 nerve tag meetings. It was busy. It was indeed busy. And you participated in a number of other groups of which we've had mention, for example, EMG, the Environmental Modeling Group, the Children's Task and Finish Working Group, the Moonshot Scientific Advisory Group, and a, and a number of other bodies or committees set up by the public agencies in the United Kingdom, including yes. Public Health England and, and government departments such as the DHSE. I did, yes. T to add to your burdens, throughout the pandemic, because of course you are the chair in infectious disease modelling at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, you were intimately concerned with the work that continued to be done by the Centre for Mathematical Modelling of Infectious Diseases, which is an integral part of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Yes, correct. And I think throughout the pandemic, the CMMID, which is what I'm going to call yes. the Centre for Mathematical Modelling of Infectious Diseases, produced a vast amount of learning and reports and advice for the United Kingdom, as well as a host of other low and medium income countries around yes. the world. It was an amazing effort. The, I'll turn in a moment to asking you just to give us a flavor of the work that the CMMID did. But before I do, I want to ask you to put your mind back and give the inquiry, please, a sense of what your understanding was in the middle of January 2020 as to the threat that was by then plainly emerging from China. You say in your statement, it was clear by early to mid-January 2020 that the novel coronavirus outbreak in China was a major public health threat. Did you mean, do you mean by that, that it was a major public health threat to the world, to the countries around China, just to China, or, or to the United Kingdom? At that very time, at uh, the middle of January, it wasn't clear whether that was a threat just to China or whether it was a threat to everyone. I think all of us thought it might well be a threat to everyone across the world. Um, but it wasn't clear at that time um, because of... Uh, it's a technical issue, um, but there was uh, the way that the, da the data were being reported from China. Um, it looked at the time... There was only 41 cases that had been reported. They'd all been, uh, they'd all attended the uh, seafood wet market in Wuhan, and no other cases were being reported. So it could have been just some odd event, uh, a quite a large event where people got exposed to something in that market, um, but it but it might not have been. And when we started to see cases outside China, then it it was it was very hard to believe that it was just a, a, a limited event. Whilst you give your evidence, Professor, could I invite you just to go a little bit slower Sorry. as well? Yeah. And to get our chronological bearings, the, the knowledge that there were cases outside China, of course, emerged 
at the end of January. No, before then, the first case outside China, I think, was about the 13th. It might be the 11th or 13th of, of January. But by the end of January, it was clear yeah. that it wasn't just one or two cases sporadically yeah. in a country outside China. There were multiple cases in multiple countries. There were, and by then the Chinese had changed the way that they were reporting their cases, and there were thousands of cases in China. We'll come to this issue later of how it was that the early data grossly underestimated the spread of the outbreak in, in China. But you've used the word major public health threat. Yeah. It was clear by mid-January that what China was grappling with was a, a viral outbreak, a, a viral pathogen, a, a disease outbreak based upon a virus. Yes, absolutely. And viruses have a tendency, it's, it's what they do, to spread exponentially. Not all, may, not, not, all not, not all of them. Not all of them. But they may do so. It was clear in mid-January, although nobody knew the extent of the spread in China, that this virus had the capacity to kill, to seriously harm, to hospitalise, and that people weren't becoming infected just because they'd had contact zoonotically with an animal. Right they were becoming infected from human-to-human -human transmission. That was then very clear. By, certainly by the end of, you know, third week, fourth week of January, that was very clear, yes. And so if human-to-human -human transmission was clear, and it was clear that it was spreading, although nobody knew to what extent, was that why you, as you, as you say, you appreciated there was a, a major public health threat? Yes. Because if the virus continued to spread and its reproduction number was more than one, that is to say every single infected person would infect more than one other person in an unimmunized population, subject to control measures being applied, the virus would continue to spread forever until herd immunity. Yes, even after herd immunity, of course, you get spread, uh, like we have now. So the basic nature of the threat was clear. It was an issue, wasn't it, of seeing whether it would spread if significantly beyond China and the countries around China. And therefore, by extension, whether there was a need to apply control measures to stop it. Yes, I would agree with that. All right. If a virus spreads at a rate greater than R, larger than one, then it, it, it will spread, we've heard, exponentially. It will grow faster and faster and faster. If, if you don't take measures to stop that, yeah. If you don't take measures. So is that why, in your field of expertise, there is this notion that when dealing with viral epidemics, which may become a viral pandemic, which is just a difference of scale, is it not? A pandemic is a worldwide epidemic. A sensible and wise approach is to apply a precautionary approach. That is to say, get on top of the problem before it beats you. Correct. And in your statement, you refer on multiple occasions to the need for the precautionary principles to be applied. It is at the very heart of epidemiology, is it not? It's how you deal with epidemics. Uh, yes, when you're talking about response epidemiology, how to respond, then yes, you do. It, it is wise to apply that precautionary principle because we, our surveillance systems are never likely to pick up every case and they're always a bit delayed. And so the epidemic is likely to be more widely spread than you think it is. And was that why you say in your statement that 
even in the early days or, or mid days of January, it was essential for the United Kingdom, as with every other country, to assemble significant data in terms of the epidemiological nature of the virus that had by then already spread outside China, and the modelling data in order to be able to work out precisely how the virus would spread and how to deal with it. That's right. So first of all, you try and characterise what you're dealing with um, in terms of, you mentioned the reproduction number, so what if you could try and estimate the reproduction number, and then other critical parameters related to the virus, for instance, obviously how uh, the infection fatality rate or case fatality rate, which is the fraction of those of the, the infections that might die, for instance. Those, these are sort of absolutely critical numbers that you try and get an early estimate of as best you can. And of course, you don't stop there. Throughout the epidemic, you might refine those estimates and they might change a bit. Um, but you spend a lot of your time trying to characterise, especially with a new disease like this, trying to understand it, how fast it might spread. And then you can start to put together uh, models to play, you know, to look at different scenarios, as it were, um, to see whether, uh, to see how you, you know, what measures might be effective or most effective against uh, this new threat. In relation to the coronavirus pandemic, that basic data, the reproduction rate, whether the virus killed, whether it hospitalized people, whether it was capable of being transmitted and was being transmitted human to human, and whether or not it was possible to become infected but not show symptoms, asymptomatic infection, yeah. whether or not it was possible to become infected and have a period of time during which you showed no symptoms, pre-symptomatic. All that, in general outline, was known fairly early on, was it not? It was certainly by early February um, uh, or mid-February. I'd have thought then we had probably reasonable estimates of, of m most of these things. Some of them, some of these things take longer to estimate. Um, for instance, the infection fatality rate takes longer because. Uh, it, sadly, it takes time for people to die if they're infected, and so you have to sort of wait for that. that I know it's a dreadful thing to talk about, but it, it, you have to wait for that to happen so you don't know uh, how many people might die until people are dying. Um, Could you keep your voice up a bit more? Sorry, please, yeah. Professor? So the infection fatality rate is vital, is it not, in yeah. terms of assessing what might happen to any particular country's healthcare system? you need to know what proportion of those infected in your population will die in order to know whether you've got enough beds, whether you've got enough health care facilities. There's, there's two, two aspects. So one is the reproduction number, the basic reproduction number, and that gives you an indication of how many people might become infected if you do nothing. Uh, so if, if you allow the epidemic just to sweep over the population and the population does nothing, so they, they don't... They, uh, um, they don't change their behaviour. And that, that gives you... So that, that tells you how many people might become infected. And then, of course, you would need to know of those who become infected, how many might die, how many might be hospitalised. And it's not just those crude numbers. You'd like to know it by different groups, like different age groups, which uh, for COVID, that was, there was enormous differences in risk by age, for instance. But the reproduction rate was estimated to be between two and three at a relatively early stage, in fact, in, in late January. The infection fatality rate, in a very broad sense, how many people will die in an unimmunized population that takes no steps to protect itself, was assessed in mid-February, preliminarily, yeah. to be 1% overall. 
it subsequently transpired that if you were over 70, or for the over 70-year-olds, the infection fatality rate, the proportion of over 70-year-olds who would die once they become infected was much higher, yeah. around 7%. In Correct. Fact. But the point, Professor, is this. Plainly, epidemiologists and modelers, and you, to use your words, like to know the precise nature of the virus, yeah. the detail of how it will behave, how it transmits, what the particular features are in, in terms of the impact on segments of the population, how the population might behave how the virus might respond to self-imposed behavioural changes. And the models, to use your word because you used it, can be used to play at the figures, to, to demonstrate these more nuanced conclusions. But the basic information about the threat of this virus and its potential fatal impact and the impact upon the health care systems of this country were known, was known, relatively early on. Correct, yes. It was known, putting together the reproduction number, the infection fatality rate, the knowledge of the size of the population in this country, the knowledge of the how big the NHS is, yeah. that was all apparent to those in the know, to the experts, Certainly by the end of February. Oh, yeah. I mean, earlier than that, really. Uh, when earlier than that do you assess? Um, sort of mid-February, I think, where we had probably a pretty good, uh, pretty good idea. You, you get an initial sketch even earlier than that, perhaps, but then, um, which might give you an you know, uh, in initial impression, but, of course, then you improve on that and then you understand the, the, some of the nuances, like the, how risk varies with age and how risk varies perhaps with other, with other sorts of uh, variables, ethnicity. Obviously, those sorts of things came later. And so would it be fair to say that when that realisation dawned, perhaps in mid-February, the absolute core consideration then became... How do we control it? How do we stop it? How do we suppress it? How do we mitigate it? How do we do anything? I think that's been the core consideration from before then, um, certainly from, right. from January when the alarm first came up. You know, how do we stop this? And unsurprisingly, experts, government officials, scientists, epidemiologists, cast their minds back to what sort of control measures we had utilised in the past. Yep. And of course, because of the flu pandemic of 2018, because of swine flu, because of... I think 1918. Sorry, what did I say? 2018. Thank you very much, Professor. Sorry. I didn't mean to put you off. <laughs> no, 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 it's quite right. 1918. <coughs> because of swine flu... <coughs> because of SARS and MERS and other, those two particular coronavirus yeah. epidemics, or pandemics perhaps, in the Middle East and Far East, <coughs> there was a basic understanding of what sort of control measures might work. Some, yeah. I, almost as well, a bit the other way around, what kind of control measures are unlikely to work as well. You know, they, uh, there's, there's two aspects to that. Thank you. For flu, there had been a qu qu quite a prolonged debate about whether school closures, for example, yeah. would work. And strategically, the government and its advisers thrashed this issue around for a, for, for a very long time indeed. Is it a good idea to close schools in the face of a flu pandemic? There had been a long-running debate again, resolved in the context of flu, whether or not shutting borders would help. Yeah. And it was generally understood that it wouldn't. It's a difference between absolutely shutting your border 
letting no one in. And restrictions. And restrictions, yeah. But generally... So restrictions were unlikely to, to, yeah. to buy much time. But we had never, at least at the last... We had day, never shut our border. We had never shut our borders to deal with flu. And we had never had a sophisticated or put into place a sophisticated system for test, trace, contact. We had to deal at the beginning of the swine flu pandemic, but mostly to understand its transmission characteristics here in the UK, rather than as a concerted effort to try and actually stop it, because there was uh, you know, widespread recognition that it, was, it would be extremely difficult and extremely resource intensive to actually try and stop a flu pandemic via contact tracing because it, it it's moved so fast that the, the, the virus moves between one generation of cases and the next so quickly that it's really impossible to keep up with it with contact tracing. And the contact tracing that was used for swine flu and, and is used actually for yeah. any new or emerging... Oh, and, and things that have been around forever. You do it for TB and for, well... HIV's not been around forever, but yes, you, you do it. It's relatively limited. You, you, you pick up travellers, you test them, you test and trace, contact trace index cases, and, and whether or not you, you, you're focusing on people coming in with the infection or you focus on the first few hundred cases or you focus on the first few cases in the hospitals, it doesn't really matter. The system was only designed to deal with the first relatively few cases. Yes. So for flu, the, the, the system was always a first few hundred uh, system. And the idea, as I said, is really to understand the, and characterise the virus here in the UK more than trying to stop it with the recognition that it was very, very unlikely to, to stop a, a flu pandemic. So... Drawing those threads together, and, and I should say, can you tell us whether or not there was, in January 2020, any system at all, whether by utilisation of past control measures or anything drawn up on paper, any system of quarantining whole segments of society or whole society of self-isolation of the whole society or social distancing the whole society? In January, February, no, there was no, no. consideration of that. It was concentrating on contact tracing. And you knew that? Knew that? You knew that there was in place no system at all for social distancing, yeah. quarantining, yeah. for whole I mean, society response? Yeah, I mean, of course, at that time... It, if we're talking about, say, February, there would have been very few cases, even you know, looking back at it now and realising how many cases there were, there were still very few. So you've got to sort of have some sort of proportionate response. Uh, you know, do you put the entire country under some sort of um, restrictions when there's, uh, you know, perhaps a handful of cases? So the idea is to really try and target it around those cases. I think the issue was... Um, we always knew that it was likely that cases would not, some cases would not be picked up. Um, we were targeting our contact tracing around cases who came in from uh, high risk areas, China being the most obvious, but other places where there was, uh, had been, cases had been picked up, which were mostly in the Far East. Um, but of course, people could come indirectly into the UK via other, other routes, and of course they did. Um, and so uh, that contact tracing uh, effort, um, it had to, it, it, you know, it had to go really well everywhere in the world for uh, for it to be for it to um, for, for it to, it for it to, to stop. Work. Yeah, exactly. And you knew that. Yeah. So you and and I make it absolutely plain, you are but one of a number of brilliant scientists and advisors who assisted the, the government and, and the country in the remarkable way that you did. But there must have been a general awareness, therefore, by February. This viral, severe pandemic 
this viral pathogenic outbreak is coming and it can't be stopped. And the measures which could stop it once it reaches the United Kingdom have either never been dreamt up or never been applied or won't work. I mean, you said can't be stopped. I mean, it was worth trying to stop it in those ways. Uh, you know, um, there was a, a hope, but maybe not an expectation that it would be stopped like that. Um, but yes, we, we knew that there was a very high likelihood. I mean, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm not going to say there's a, you know, there was an extremely high likelihood that, that we would that we would face a, a very, very major pandemic. Yes, we, we knew that. And when you say we would face a very, very major pandemic, you mean, so that we are clear? Something like 1918. That was, that was always, you know, that would have been, and of course that's the great, it was the great influenza pandemic of more than 100 years ago. You know, it sort of etched in people's, especially in my field, of course, the sort of collective uh, memory as being a horrendous event. And this looked, uh, it was a, it was you know every time a new bit of data came in it, it just sort of confirmed that this was going to be something like that uh, you know a, a once in a hundred years event horrific and because there was no sophisticated test trace contact isolate system in place because such things weren't generally used for flu for which we've been preparing Although this coronavirus had a latency period, a gap between when you become infected and when you can pass on the infection to somebody else, in which gap you can be tested and seen whether you are positive for the disease. Until such a system could be developed, designed and put into place, it would be of little practical assistance. So, um, you know, by, by late January, early, late January, say early February, um, we knew something about the characteristics, and you quite rightly say, so that there was quite a long period between infection and you becoming um, ill, you know, of, of sort of five or six days, um, which is very different to flu, which is sort of one or two days. Um, and so there was a possibility that gave you a bit more time if you were trying to contact trace. I mean, if you're trying to con contact trace, it gave you, a, gave you a bit more time to be able to do it. Um, in terms of are you infectious before you become symptomatic, with SARS-1, that didn't look like that was the case. So with SARS-1, that, that time period was a bit longer. It was more like eight days. And it looked like you became infectious when you became symptomatic and you were very ill uh, with SARS-1 and so most people were in hospital very quickly and so it was easier to contact trace the SARS-1 and that's how it was stamped out globally. The flu you just wouldn't be able to do it because of the speed. And SARS-2, COVID, was somewhere in between. It gave you a glimpse of maybe that might be possible uh, but everything had to go really well for it to, to work. But in practice, whether epidemiologically a test system was possible didn't matter, did it? Because in January, February, March, beyond the first few hundred cases, before the first few index cases, there was no whole society test, trace, contact system. No. You, strictly speaking, you don't need to test people. You can isolate them anyway, you know, on symptoms and things like that. So obviously it's much better to test them because then they know they have it or they know they don't have it. But, but, but strictly speaking, you don't need to test people. So to come back to your earlier answer, by mid-February, there was an understanding that there was a major pandemic coming. Yes. And so again, uh, so that we are clear, a major pandemic means tens of thousands of hospitalization cases. And more. And more. Hundreds of thousands, perhaps. It means tens of thousands, perhaps more, of deaths. Oh, yes, and again, more. It means the country being overwhelmed 
by disease? Yes, it's more than that. Uh, you know, once the reason why the flu pandemic was at the top of the national risk register, it was always known that an event like that would affect every aspect of society, every aspect of government. So it wasn't just that it would overwhelm the health service and cause, uh, um, you know, a huge amount of disease, uh, but also it would affect people's lives in other way and, and the society quite fundamentally in other ways. That, that, that was always known for these major, major events. And as you've said, by mid-February, there was only the hope, not the expectation, that it might be stopped. Yes. Why then, as a country, did we not apply the precautionary principle to which you have already referred and do something about it then? I think the risk then was still low to a, a person. Sorry, please, please be more slowly. slowly yeah. It's very important that we apologize. I'm trying to get the, the I apologize. Um, so I think the risk for an individual in, in, in this country in February was very, very low, of, of COVID was very, very low. So um, could you go, take national restrictive measures? Um, could, would people come along with that? Um, you know, I, I, think, I think that that would be difficult. I think it would be a hard sell. But that professor was surely a matter for our politicians and our decision makers. That was for them to decide, was it not? Yeah, it was, of course. I think there are other things in between. Uh, you're going to, you're, you're kind of jumping to the nuclear option. I, I think there are other things in between that perhaps could have been done. I thought, I thought about it later. I thought, you know, what could we have done that would be more proportionate? I think things like advice to work at home, we could have perhaps done that. Yes, it would have had an impact on the economy. Um, but and and I you know I regret that we didn't look at that at that time, um, and, and there are things there are other things like uh, we could have given we gave public health advice that was being given to wash your hands and things like that which are sensible, um, but we could have perhaps made it really clear that people should stay at home if they had any sort of symptoms, despite the fact that almost all of them wouldn't have had COVID, almost all of them would have had flu or coughs and colds or whatever, you know, because COVID was vanishingly rare even at that time. Um, so I think maybe there are things that we could have perhaps uh, emphasised in, in, in February that might have slowed things a little bit. They weren't going to stop it, but they might have slowed things a little bit more than they did. We're going to come, of course, to the detail of the advice that you and SpyMO and Sage gave to the government. But the nature of the response was you accept a matter for government. What I'm asking you, though, is, is why was that terrible conclusion, that dawning realisation that the virus was coming, it was a fatal pathogenic disease, and there was in practice, you understood, not much more than a hope that it could be controlled. Why was that warning, why was that realisation not made more apparent to government in middle, the middle of February, to the public, yeah. to, the, to the United Kingdom, yeah. that this pathogenic tsunami was coming? So I, I distinctly remember my <clears throat> feeling at the time. I, I assumed that the government did know all of this. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I can't believe that they didn't, quite honestly. I still can't believe that they didn't. But, but I, so I assumed that they did know all of this and that actions were being taken. I, the messaging at the time was, was very reassuring. And I, I assumed that there was a plan. Let's not concern people and bother people now uh, because we'll have to... We'll have, to, we'll have to get people prepared and do it in the right way. That was my assumption at the time. Um, afterwards, I, I look back on it and think, actually, really, uh, you know, was there a plan? I, I'm not sure. 
But uh, I assumed that there was. I assumed that the messaging, being quite reassuring, was there for a reason. I'm not asking you to speak for the government. And we'll come later to how the government responded to the advice you actually did give. I'm asking you, and through you vicariously, Sage and SpyMO yeah. and SpyB and all the august, brilliant advisory committees, the epidemiologists, the modelers, the virologists, why was that warning not being shouted out from all, all of you yeah. from mid-February? Yeah. So I didn't think we had to shout it. Um, I, I, you know, in terms of the government, I, 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 you know, something of this magnitude, you'd have thought the government should have all its attention paid to it, you'd think. Uh, so there's that. Secondly, um, yeah, I, I kind of just assumed that there was some reason for not shouting it out. I remember quite distinctly, I remember Neil Ferguson um, gave a, uh, did say something on Radio 4, and I remember Chris Whitty also saying something. Um, there was this kind of funny period where people would talk about, as you're talking about, the you know, the reproduction number and the implications that would mean for how many people might get infected in an unmitigated wave. And there was talk about the infection fatality rate. And so, you know, you could easily just multiply those two numbers together and get a very big number for deaths. But people didn't. I was... Um, you know, people avoided multiplying, you know, in public utterances. And I felt that, I honestly thought, I mean, it sounds really naive and silly, I think, but I honestly thought there was a plan. I didn't want to be the person who multiplied those two numbers and together. And, um, and I thought that should come from someone central in a kind of organised, uh, in an organised comms plan way to prepare prepare the country for what was going to happen. And I, I didn't want to get it, I didn't want to mess that up in any way. Before we... your mid-flow, Mr Keith. May I ask one more question yeah. and there will be a very natural break. You, your, your statement makes plain, Professor, um, how much work was, was done by the CMM, CMMID working group at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, you describe it as brilliantly led and organised by your colleagues, um, in particular a, a Dr Rosalind Ego. You describe how over those three months, January, February and March, you undertook, or the rather the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine undertook a huge range of work right from the early days, yep. assessing the nature of the initial outbreak, accumulating data, analysing the spread of the virus, looking at the reporting delays from China, how difficult it was to, to get a handle on the nature of the spread. You looked at airport screening, methods of transmission, rates of testing, contact tracing, isolation, the case fatality ratio, then latterly in March, the effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions, which let's just speak it out, how to control the virus, whether it would be a wave or a second wave, what was herd immunity, whether we should be suppressing or mitigating, whether we should have an episodic lockdown process. But this vast learning nowhere says, at least until March, there is a pathogenic tsunami coming and it can't be stopped. You know, I think that was clear to all of us. Um, yes, uh, it wasn't me who raised that alarm to the public. I deliberately didn't. Um, as, I, as I've explained to you, I didn't want to. I didn't think. I didn't think it was for me to do that. I thought it was for for someone with more authority to to do that and to prepare people for what was likely to come. Thank you, Milady. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you're warned, Professor, that we take regular breaks. So yeah. I shall return at 20 to 12.
Mr. Keith. Continuing, Professor, with the theme of the, the generic understanding in the scientific community, the scientific advisory community in January. It is absolutely vital, I, I, I make plain and put to you, that you, of course, Professor Edmonds, had absolutely no personal responsibility for having to stand up and tell the government what it should be doing, what was going to happen, because you were part of SAGE, SPIMO, all the many bodies, and it was those bodies which had been constituted in order to give government advice. That that's a, a fair summary, is it not? Yes, but it doesn't stop me feeling that I had some responsibility. Well, if I may say so, that is very much to your credit. And the way in which the structure worked was that these many august and brilliant bodies were constituted to assemble information, assemble data, give advice, and then that advice was, and it was very clear how it could be done and should be done, was routed to government through the CMO, the Chief Medical Officer, the Governmental Chief Scientific Advisor, yeah. through the minutes, through the papers which were given to the committees, through the documents that you produced. And can I say I'm, I'm absolutely sure that the CMO and the Chief Government uh, Scientist Advisor uh, both raised this. I am, there's no way that they didn't. Yes. And we'll come to it in a moment. Your own emails, personal emails to Professor Ferguson, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, Sir Patrick Valence, raise the issue of urgency and the need to, to act. And we'll, we'll come to those in a moment. But the point, and we'll also look at SAGE, the point, though, is, is this, isn't it, that systemically or systematically there was a structure in place to give the government advice, to, to warn it, to tell it what might happen and to give it the information to enable it to decide to respond rapidly, proportionately, effectively. But that system doesn't appear to have worked. Clearly not. I mean, if you think about it, though, SAGE is, um, only sits in an emergency. And it was called to sit in uh, somewhere around the 20th. You'll know the date exactly. But, uh, you know, in, in the 20-something of January. So somewhere, someone in government thought that it was sufficient you know, it was sufficiently, emer you know, um, there was a sufficient emergency to call SAGE. SAGE doesn't, only sits very seldom in these kind of, kind of situations. So someone thought that it was worthy of calling SAGE together. Before we leave the, the subject entirely of the, the working group at um, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and, and the issue of the, the vast amounts of work that were done. Could I ask you please to, to look at uh, one particular paper that dated from the 7th of February 2020, which is INQ 409645. You can carry on, I know what paper it is, yeah. Oh, yes, we need to get it up on the screen there, Professor, for everybody else. So this is a paper dated the 7th of February. It's called Feasibility of Controlling 2019 Novel Coronavirus Outbreaks by Isolation of Cases and Contacts. So at, at a relatively early stage, the 7th of February, the, the London School of Hygiene, and, and this isn't a SAGE paper, it's a paper done by, the, by your... The, your Research Institute's working group was on to the issue of how easy or difficult or effective controlling the virus by isolation of contacts and cases would be. Yeah. Hence your evidence earlier about the very early understanding of how difficult it would be to control the virus by 
isolation and contact trace. And the summary of the findings in the bottom half of the page are these. Well, the summary is this. The percentage of contacts trace is critical to achieving control in all scenarios. Higher transmission, a higher R0, makes outbreaks more difficult to control. By this time, it was a, you did have some basic understanding of the likely yeah. reproduction number. What was it? You know, it, there, were, there was still, there was a lot, the estimates vary between about two and a half and three and a half at the time. So not as high as some other or some high consequence infectious diseases? Mm, but, but higher than most high consequence infectious diseases. That two and a half or three doesn't sound bad, but it's bad. Yes, I'd say higher than, not as high as some, but higher than, than many. 30% transmission before symptoms makes control less likely in all scenarios. By that, were you saying, was your working group saying, if you've got a high number of people who are asymptomatic, who... Pre-symptomatic. That's about pre-symptomatic. So, okay. so if you are infectious before you become symptomatic... And we had different scenarios for that, so different assumptions. Because um, we didn't know that very well at that time, although right. that was becoming clearer. My um, mistake, the asymptomatic bullet it's, point it's is at a the bit bottom. lower down, yeah. But let's have a look at that. The presence of subclinical asymptomatic cases has an outsized and negative impact on probability to achieve control. Yeah. By that, were you saying if a large proportion of infected people are asymptomatic, that is to say they don't show symptoms, then th your ability to achieve control is hindered and the probability that you will be able to achieve control goes down. Correct. And you also say 60 to 80% of contacts must be traced and transmission stopped in order to achieve control in most scenarios and more for some characteristics. So you've got to practically be able to stop a very large number, a very large percentage of contacts for transmission chains to be broken. Correct. So you have to, you, you have to quickly isolate, uh, uh, co contact trace, a large fraction of the contacts, and effectively quarantine them. Was it these findings in early February which led you to conclude that as you began to appreciate the asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic nature of the viral pandemic, uh, epidemic, and the transmission rates that effectively contact trace control was going to be extremely difficult. I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I, this paper was a little bit of a one of those. The, the results here are a bit, of, a little bit of one of those. Is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? Um, you know, it said it was possible to do it, uh, potentially, to, to, but th things had to go very well for that. Um, yeah, that, that's really a summary. All right. Um, I want to ask you now about SAGE and functionally how SAGE operated vis-a-vis -vis the government. Um, you had uh, attended earlier forms, emanations of SAGE, be because I think you'd been on SAGE during the Ebola crisis. Correct. So you were very familiar with the workings of SAGE. Familiar, I wouldn't say very familiar, yeah. When the, the virus um, began to emerge from China, Spy M, of which we've heard a great deal, alongside SAGE being brought together, was also put into place, was brought together, and changed its focus to looking specifically at COVID-19. Yeah. Um, Nerve tag, we've heard, continued to operate. It was a standing statutory committee to the DHSC. It deals with new and emerging viral threats, but it also looked at COVID-19, of course. 
when you were on SAGE, were you attending as a representative of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Med Medicine, or, or, or do you I, I and did all there. your colleagues attend in a personal capacity? I was just there in a personal capacity. And it's self-evident there were a very great number of experts on SAGE. You describe the level of advice and the level of understanding on the part of the attendees at SAGE as, as being very high. I mean, SAGE was very, very well informed, was it not? Absolutely. All of you were experts in your own fields, but you were obviously capable of opining on related subjects. And the evidence is that a great deal of information was culled by members of SAGE from their contacts and their professional colleagues abroad. Correct. So, in summary, do you agree that, that SAGE, in terms of its ability to locate, consider, and report on data and on information and on this field of expertise was very high indeed? Yes, absolutely. The papers produced by SAGE, in particular the minutes, weren't really minutes though, were they? They were more of a consensus document brought to bringing together a, a final concluded position. Did you think that that worked, or do you think that worked? Do you think having a consensus document was a good thing because it gave the government a clear understanding of a final position, mm -hmm. or, or perhaps was was undermined by or, or flawed by the tendency of such an approach to conceal nuance, to conceal the width of debate? I think that, I, you know, I think you could probably have done both. Uh, have a consensus statement and then have maybe fuller minutes or, or something. So if you were interested, you could see the, uh, how the debate went. Um, but as it was, it was just this very terse, uh, short document with a, a consensus. Was the information flow with government one way or two ways? No, it was one way. It okay. came from us through Patrick and Chris, sorry, um, Patrick, yeah. Sir, Sir Chris Whitty and, and Sir Patrick Sir Chris, Yeah, Sir Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Valance uh, to, um, to central government. We, we didn't have any, we didn't play any role in that so that there is absolutely no question about it whatsoever. There, was, that there is nothing to suggest that they conveyed the information from SAGE to the government other than properly, faithfully. Oh, I'm absolutely and, sure and they would have done. And, and it didn't come back because, I mean, they're consummate professionals, of course. And so they, we didn't know what the government was discussing. Um, you know, they didn't report on that. Of course they didn't. So it went one way, um, that's how it was. Did you understand on SAGE that they were conveying the consensus position which SAGE had reached, or that they were conveying the whole range of debate, the issues which had been explored, and perhaps the divergence of views which had been apparent in argument? I don't know, of course, because I wasn't there. Um, but we did used to try and include a statement about certainty or uncertainty in, in everything. I say everything, I, I would hope it, just about everything. So when, when there was a statement made, and it was, it, there would be a very broad indication of uh, how certain that statement was. You, or rather SAGE, was a scientific, is a scientific advisory committee. Did you see the role of SAGE as properly extending to giving the government policy advice or making specific recommendations as to what it should do? I didn't. Uh, I viewed the process in sort of three steps. I thought um, that there was the sort of evidence um, synthesis step, which was our uh, SAGE. Oh, and obviously there could have been evidence synthesis in other aspects. Um, economic aspects, social aspects that we weren't covering. 
uh, but uh, I felt that we were involved in the evidence synthesis, trying to summarise the evidence, and then that went forward to central government somehow, to the policy makers, who I, in my view are the senior civil servants, who weigh up those, put, put that, that aspect of the evidence together along with the other, because of course any policy would have huge implications for society uh, you know, beyond the epidemiology or the, the, the health implications. And so- uh, you just I, slow down a little uh, bit. Apologies. Professor, you're running away so, from us. <laughs> so I felt that then the, that second step was being done by uh, the policy makers, the senior the civil service, and then the final step, uh, you know, they would come up with, uh, this is my mental model, I don't know whether it's actu accurate, but I, uh, and then the final sign off on which of the preferred options would of course be made by our elected representatives. Was it the role, do you think, of individual members of SAGE to publicly advocate for particular measures to be taken or for policy to, to go to the press and say, I think this should be done. Why isn't the government doing that? Or we, SAGE, aren't doing enough? I, th I think it was difficult. Uh, uh, so my, I think the answer to that is, should we have done it, done that sort of thing? Probably no, because that didn't necessarily help the government make its, I thought that, and we were, you know, Chris and Patrick both uh, uh, made this clear to us that, that it didn't necessarily help the government uh, consider the evidence in a, in, a, in a cool and calm way if they were getting pressure from, from seniors, from, from senior advisors. Um, I have to say, so I, I, I tried to stick to that in the early part of the epidemic, later in the epidemic, at times, I, I struggled with trying to stick to that, and I don't think I always did. I, I did, yeah. Professor, it's fair to say that you, you gave a number of interviews to the press. You spoke to Reuters in April, on the 8th of April, I think, the Sunday Times in May, the Andrew Marr programme in May. You went on the Robert Peston programme. I think at a later stage, perhaps Andrew Marr as well. Yeah. Was the, the tendency of some members of SAGE to, to speak to the press and, and to talk about the, the guts of what had to be done or what was being done or not being done, do you think that helped this process of giving scientific advice to the government? So, uh, I, possibly not. I tried not to give... To, 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 to make statements about what the government should or shouldn't do in any of those interviews. <coughs> Sometimes it's, they're, very, they're very eloquent, they're very clever at their art, and they get things out of you that perhaps, um, perhaps you didn't want to divulge. Uh, so I tried not to. What I tried to do, because I did think it was, well, I've always thought that it's important that we should explain to the public um, you know, science generally, I think, you know, outside of a pandemic, I think we should explain our work to the public who are ultimately funding it in most instances. Um, and in this particular case, of course, they were being directly affected by the measures that were being put in place or not being put in place. And I felt that it was, that there was a responsibility on us to, to try and explain of the science, and also I try to explain, I mean, if you saw my interviews on wherever, uh, I tried to explain that this was not easy, that there was never an easy solution to any of this, and this was difficult, and the government were having to make really difficult decisions, having to trade off different aspects of uh, you know, health and wealth and, and whatever. I, I tried to explain that, that, that this was a very, very difficult thing because it was. They were dreadful decisions that they were having to make. Indeed. Um, more on SAGE. The inquiries heard evidence for, from a number of attendees on SAGE that because the government never told SAGE what its strategies were, what its overall objectives might be, or in essence what it wanted to achieve, 
when providing advice, Sage what was to some extent shooting in the dark. Would you agree? Um, yes, I think I think I said in my statement it's very it's very difficult to plot a course when you don't know what the destination is. And in terms of the membership of, of Sage, the the membership of Sage grew enormously, not least because it was able to go online and did go online yes. on the onset of the pandemic. It was obviously a, a scientific committee and it had a number of august biomedics, epidemiologists, modelers, um, public health experts. It was attended also, wasn't it, by representatives of NHS England, Public Health England, and of course the CMO and the government chief scientific advisor who are world-renowned experts in their own right. Yeah. Would it have benefited from a greater input from frontline organisations? I thought, I personally felt uh, that that would have helped at times. I thought that there were times, particularly at the beginning when our data were terrible, that our situational awareness of what was really happening wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, and so I would have I would have preferred to have, uh, yes, I thought, I would have liked to hear a little bit more from the front line. In fact, uh, with nerve tag, um, I, I, I knew that PHE, for instance, you had started to do um, what they called a sit rep. Uh, um, and this was a large number of slides. You know, there was, it was huge. It was like 50, 60 slides that they were putting together every week, which gave a summary of the, well, the situation report. And I sort of I, I asked on NerveTag whether we could see that uh, at the start of NerveTag meetings, so that we could uh, get a little bit better, uh, a bit, a bit more holistic understanding of what was really happening. Um, and that did happen, um, so that was accepted. And, and uh, PHE used to start NerveTag with a with a brief sit rep. What did SAGE make of the government's mantra that it was at cru crucial times following the science? Uh, well, you know, the government uh, couldn't and shouldn't ever have just followed the science. That was only one aspect of the, it was only one aspect of the, uh, of the epidemic. Um, and so they had to weigh uh, um, Advice, or you know, um, on on various aspects, whether it was economic or or social, or of course operational, um, as well as the the scientific aspect. So, I thought that that was always um, I could see why they were doing it. They were doing it so they could hide hide behind us. I think so. When difficult decisions had to be made, that they could uh, uh, hide behind us. Is science ever certain? Can it ever no, be? F no. Is there ever one piece of science which can be followed? No. That's the, so that was that exactly. So that's why we try to represent the level of uncertainty in the statements we were making at, um, at these sorts of meetings, um, because of course, especially at the beginning of a of a pandemic of a, a completely novel disease. I mean, uh, uncertainty is huge. Why did Sage or perhaps you've feel the government was trying to hide behind you? It's what they do. It's convenient, isn't it? Was Sage enormously assisted by, well, a great deal, many other unsung heroes? I think a secretariat. You received enormous assistance from something called the Department of Health and Social Care Health Protection Analytical Team. Yeah, they were amazing. The secretariat for Sage, it's it's hard to describe the the um, the, the how much work was being done, and to bring that together, you know, uh, and to make sense uh, in say if I, if we think of the uh, spy M work, enormous amount of work that was being done every week, technical, difficult, not not something that lay people would necessarily be able to get a grasp of, and um, the secretariat. 
importantly, at, with SPIM, included modelers. There's a health protection analytical team within, the, it's a small team, but within the Department of Health and Social Care. And they formed uh, a part of the secretariat for SPIM. And uh, so then the discussions that we were having, they were, they were following them, they were understanding them, um, so they could, because these discussions were technical, far-ranging, difficult. And to summarise that in these consensus statements that they did uh, was an amazing piece of work. And similar work was being done by the civil servants, uh, Go Science and others. The, the, the secretariat support was spectacular. And to be clear, SAGE and, and SPY-M and, and NERVTAG weren't just responding to particular commission requests from government. Every week, or perhaps every meeting, these committees would have presented before them, because they'd been prepared since the last meeting, round up of information, updated projections, rolling charts, voluminous papers on what the position was correct. you could consider as part of your then you, your your analysis. Yeah, correct. So it's probably worth, I don't know whether you want to get into the details, but there was different ways of working on the different committees. SPY-M, or SPY-MO more correctly, um, at the time was a little different from the others in that um, it had some routine tasks it did every week, uh, which was short-term projections, uh, medium-term projections, estimation of the reproduction number, uh, and so on. And, and they were done by many groups contributing to that every week. So there was a um, so there was a kind of routine piece of work. There were the commissions that came to us from, from central government ask, asking us to, uh, to do some work on a particular aspect. Um, and they came most weeks, as from recollection. Um, and then on top of that, there was work that, that, that we did off our own bat because we felt that it was important. Like, for instance, the work that you just highlighted earlier. Nobody asked us to do that. We, 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 we got on with that in, in January and then brought it to spy him, uh, you know, at the appropriate time. Now, can I turn, please, to modelling, which is, of course, your, your special team. Um, shortly, can you explain the difference, please, between scenario modelling and forecasts? So forecasts are what we think will happen, uh, and scenarios are what might happen under certain circumstances. Um, and they usually run those scenarios over a longer period of time, so you could see the impact uh, of those different uh, circumstances. So if I could give an, an analogy um, Please. from the... So we have a weather forecast. And that tells us um, that tells us it gives a probabilistic statement about what might what the weather might be tomorrow or the day after whatever. So it might say something like there's an eighty percent chance of rain tomorrow. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. It's going to rain, probably. There's an eighty percent chance or not. The only thing you can do is take an umbrella or a Mac or something. Yeah. Um, a scenario is something quite different, and it runs over a much longer period. Uh, so the scenario models for um, looking at climate change, for instance, so looking at what might happen over the long term, over you know, 10, 20, 30 years, if we do something, if we take certain action to, say, reduce our CO2 emissions, for instance, this might happen to the climate. Now, those are obviously very uncertain. They run over a very long time period. But there, you have the decision makers, and in this case, it's sort of the globe, all of us, I guess, have some ability to, to, to change the future. So on the basis of these scenarios, you could say, well, really, we ought to be doing this to, say, reduce our carbon dioxide output, for instance, which might then change the future. There might, might, we might have less of an increase in global temperatures. And it was the, it's the same sort of thing for epidemiological forecasts, which are very short term and just say things like, how many beds might there be uh, required next week? 
or perhaps the week after, they're, they're sh very short term, just like the weather forecast is very short term, versus these longer term scenarios. Okay, if we put this policy in place, what might happen? If we put that policy in place, what might happen? Now, they're, of course, played out over a much longer period. They're much more, because they're going over a much longer period, they're, they're, they're not going to be right. The, 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 the actual, the actual the, the epidemic will really be exactly like this in two or three months. It's, the, the chances of that are very low, of course. Right. They sketch out possibilities, just like the climate change Versus. modelling are sketching out possibilities. All right. In the context of COVID, the forecast, therefore, focused, did they not, on, on fairly, it's no less important, but fairly basic information, like how many people will die if you do nothing? How many beds will need to be occupied? How many hospital cases are there likely to be? And so on. That's, those are examples, fairly basic Yeah, ones. and they were very short term, so it's sort of uh, looking ahead just one or two weeks. And in order to be able to forecast in that way, as you've explained, a modeler needs to have an understanding of the reproduction number, the infection fatality rate, the hospitalization rate, that sort of basic data. Strictly speaking, yes, you certainly need the data. Of course you need the data. But strictly speaking, you don't necessarily need to know the reproduction number to forecast how many, how many hospital beds you might need the next week. Um, you need to look at the trends and you could just... So there's simple ways you could do it, just looking at trends and projecting forward. All right. um, there, and what happened was that there were a, a large range of different methods that were used by the different groups around the country uh, and brought together in a, and then combined in a, in a statistical way to come up with a, um, a, what's called an ensemble forecast. Even a forecast of a fairly basic type perhaps based on fairly basic information, like up taking a percentage of how many people in the population might die or how many might be hospitalised, requires the modeller to, to have a, a good understanding of the underlying data. So if there is a delay in people being tested or there's a delay in getting the results of those tests to the modeller, or if there is an unwillingness on people who are infected to be tested at all, or if there aren't any sophisticated surveys or blood tests which have been carried out in order to see how many people are infected if they're not prepared to be tested. A lack of data of that type makes the modeler's life very difficult indeed. Of course. In fact, actually, one of the things that we are actually one of the roles in the, uh, is to understand those delays. And so there's, not just, a, there's not, a, not just a matter of forecasting into the future, but there's this dreadful term now casting, which is how many cases there actually are now, because that's not, because the, the reported cases won't be reflecting the actual infections occurring on that day. They're reflecting something that happened perhaps weeks earlier. And so we could, we, we can take, uh, with understanding of these delays, then we can actually get a better idea about what's actually happening now. It's, uh, it's, it's a dreadful term, but it's quite explanatory, now casting. So that was one of the roles that we were, of course, doing. And so for SAGE and, and the modelling experts on it, there was a very real problem in February and early March, was there not? Because you couldn't be sufficiently precise in even these basic forecasts until you had the right data and you were receiving the data in good time? We weren't doing forecasts in February. There wasn't really sufficient data to do it. We started doing it in March. Right. In terms of the scenario modelling, that is to say, what might happen if we do this? Do you think that that distinction between forecasting and the contingent possibility of what might happen if we do or don't do this. Do you think that distinction was properly understood by the government and the public? No. Um, I think sometimes at times may have been deliberately misunderstood. 
So we were so very frequently our scenarios about what might happen were afterwards treated as a forecast. Um, when we changed the we, we, the government had taken action to avoid that scenario. A classic example would be, I mean, uh, the work on looking at the first wave and how many deaths there might happen in a first wave and a scenario that, 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 that you know, we were working on and uh, Neil Ferguson's group at Imperial Worlds were working on would be, you know, there were many scenarios, but one of which would be what happens if we take no action and nobody changes their behavior. That would be the kind of absolute worst case scenario. Um, and uh, of course, we took action to, you know, and, and the, the, both our, my group and Neil's group, the work suggested that that scenario would be devastating. There would be hundreds of thousands of deaths, uh, hospitalizations way above what the NHS could cope. All right. but. We took action to avoid that. So the government took action to avoid that. So to compare then what happened with that scenario is 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 actually meaningless, really. And I want to ask you about two particular examples. You, you've mentioned one of them in, indirectly already. Um, the report nine, so-called, by Imperial College, are uh, on the 16th, I think, of March. Yeah was actually part of a wider body of material. You had drawn up, I think, on the 3rd of March, learning from a meeting on the 1st of March that also looked at how many deaths might occur or would occur if there was a failure to take control measures and what the impact would be on the NHS. And Professor Stephen Riley, from whom a lady heard, also gave evidence about his own work, series of papers between the 3rd and the 10th of March. Professor Ferguson's work, or rather the work of Imperial College London, that Report 9, w was met with um, a, a storm, really, of um, uh, a storm of reaction and, and, in some places, criticism, and was accused, he was accused of being outrageously alarmist. Were these modelings, were these scenario modellings, particularly of, of March, which set out what would happen if steps weren't taken, in fact, unduly alarmist? I don't think so. Um, you know, we were, as you, we said before, from early on, you could see that this, were, this had the, this was the, you know, this had all the characteristics of being a, a, a nightmare in terms of epidemiologically. It was a respiratory infection, so very easy to spread. Clearly very uh, transmissible in the community. And um, although an infection fatality ratio of 1% doesn't sound like a lot, when, of course, you, you match that with if, if no action is taken, a large fraction of the population will become infected very rapidly, that then that then leads to a huge number of deaths. A second example, so moving forward, in fact, to the autumn, um, the government gave a press conference where some particular documents were used to, to not directly use, I think, to justify the lockdown, but they were certainly put into play and they were documents which had been produced some weeks before by a number of modelling groups. So your own London School of Hygiene, I think Imperial, Warwick. PHE in Cambridge. PHE Cambridge, yeah. thank you. And they were, they were work done at the request of the Cabinet Office to, to point out what the very worst or one of the one of the worst, or maybe even the the worst, the reasonably worst case scenario might be. Yeah, there were there were. It was an early step to try and work up a, a new reasonable worst case scenario. These reasonable worst case scenarios were used for government planning, um, and it was an early step. Actually, 
at the request of SPIMO Secretariat initially All right. to come up with some uh, uh, so to come up with some uh, some scenarios well, what might happen over the next few months. All right. L weeks later, yeah. they were relied upon. They to, were. Uh, the extent to which they relied upon needn't detain us, but th there was a massive reaction in the press, was there not? Because the press were saying, well, look, these documents appear to show X number of deaths, but they haven't happened, or they won't happen. Yeah. The short answer was they were only scenario models and they were reasonable worst case scenario models to boot and they were draft documents Correct. and they were being prepared for a different purpose. Correct. And right. it was worse than that, in fact, because every week we were doing medium term projections. So, again, the various groups contributing to SPY MO were doing medium term projections over, over a period of... Um, Six weeks, I think, is what um, four to six weeks is what we were doing, and every and each of those groups were contributing to an ensemble estimate of what we thought would happen if nothing changed. Um, and then every week, we would look at how well we did last week and learn from it. So we would look at each individual model, how well that had projected what had happened in the coming week, and also the ensemble estimate, how well that had, had done, how well that had performed in the coming week, and, and the whole process would, would move on. So since the date when those reasonable worst case scenarios were generated at the beginning of October, there were three weeks or more of these more, what we think are more likely to happen, um, uh, you know, and and that had, those estimates had been validated by looking at what actually did happen. And they were doing, and they were actually capturing the, the trends really rather well. So the government could have used that much more accurate, those much more accurate scenarios, of uh, medium term projections to, it didn't matter in a way. They were all still saying, unless action is taken, um, the NHS will come under severe will come under severe stress very shortly. It, but, um, uh, but, but the way it was done and it, the way it was, the, 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 to use the reasonable worst case, it, it reflected very badly on us. It made right. us look like we were, um, well, we, they were, we were called do That you were being alarmist. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll just have a quick look at some of the reaction. 212171. Apocalyptic forecast of 4,000 coronavirus deaths a day could be five times too high and had already been proved wrong when the government revealed it at the weekend. Yeah, well, we would have said the same thing. Um, and, and the, of course, the whole point of getting this ensemble estimate together is that it would uh, downplay, downweight the more extreme estimates. Mm -hmm. Just the same way with sort of climate change, you know, uh, some models might give a higher estimate of, of what the impact might be and some lower. And it's the same thing here. And then by bringing many, many different models together, you get a, a consensus. Uh, um, and so what was done here was pick the worst, the worst, the most alarmist bit of, the, the, of that, that. So of those four reasonable worst case scenarios, the Daily Mail here is picking the, the worst one. Uh, and we would never have presented we would never have presented it like that. We were presenting these consensus estimates, which of course would downplay the extremes and and and, and uh, focus on the most you know where there's most support from the different statistical the different models. All right. So it's very ironic, really. You say in your statement that it's, it's some... them being alarmist, not us. You say in your statement, Professor, there are, there are some lessons which can be drawn. Yeah. Firstly, the limitations of models needs to be more clearly, widely understood. Yeah. These are scenario models. They, they are all contingent. What might happen if we don't do something? 
Secondly, government in future needs to be much clearer and, and more straightforward in the way in which it will rely upon such models and use them. It and needs them, of course. It, it needs, needs to have those forward looks, um, and, but it needs to be treated with some care. And, and also, thirdly, I think you would suggest that the, the, the way in which this valuable work was done, uh, was treated in some parts of the press, what was um, very unpleasant. It was, bad, indeed, yeah. As well as being wrong. Exactly. All right. I now want to come, please, to discuss some of the, some of the particular measures that Sage debated um, it, during the course of, of February um, and early March. On the 29th of January, um, you were party to an email string with Professor Chris Whitty. Could we have that up, please? 212194. We can see at the top of the page that the final email is from Chris Whitty. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Further down, further down the page on the 29th of January, you've written to him saying, we're going to have a, a go at looking at the potential impact of mass school closure yeah. over the next few days. Obviously, closing of schools was an important issue that was being looked at. Yeah. But if we go further down to the near the origin of the, the, the beginning of the string and over the page, we can see that you've written a fairly lengthy email to Sir Chris Whitty. My comments are, given the apparent speed of spread, it seems unlikely that contact tracing and isolation is going to be effective at buying us much time. Is that a reflection of the debate, in fact, that, or the evidence you gave earlier, which is, it, it was apparent, this was the... Yeah, so that work was being finalised at the time. I mean, this is 29th, I think we put it on our website yes. one week later. So you were clear and you told, obviously, the recipients of this email that your view was that contact tracing and isolation would be unlikely to be effective at buying much time. I was taking the glass half empty view of it, of the results. You were right. Yeah. Um, in relation to... Unfortunately. In relation to travel advice uh, and exit screening, you've already given some evidence about that. What was the position that the, the World Health Organization had beforehand generally advised that screening and, and restriction short of complete closure of a border were unlikely to be efficient or effective? Correct, yes. They've done a review of all of the global literature on it and come to that conclusion. And so... That was for flu, of course. It was concentrating on flu, but it wouldn't be very, very different. But we did look at it. And if we could have 212206, did you enter into, again, another email string with, I think this time, Sir Patrick Valance, Sir Chris Whitty, Professor Sir Jonathan Van Damme, Dame Jenny Harris and Charlotte Watts at the Home Office. You say in this email at the top of the page, a concerted travel ban with our closest neighbours from whom indirect travel from China would be expected is going to be far more effective than us going it alone. Yeah. However, even that is likely to have relatively limited impact, buying a few weeks at best. The question is, what could you achieve in this time? Very little in terms of vaccines, but it might give the Chinese time to bring the epidemic under control. Yeah, so I thought if, if they could bring it under control, they were uh, under lockdown then, then um, maybe we might get away with this. And Sage, around the same time, the next day, in fact, the 3rd of February, 212208, concluded... Um, based upon a paper with which it was provided. If we could go to page, the I think the second page, please, of 
this document, the 3rd of February. Point one, on the expected impact of travel restrictions, SAGE estimates with limited data that if the UK reduces imported infections by 50%, this would maybe delay the onset of any epidemic by about five days. 75% would buy maybe 10 days, 90% maybe 15 additional days. Yeah. SAGE considered a report, we won't need to get it up, in which I think the London School of Hygiene, perhaps had, had, rather than ICL, had concluded that tests or modelling had shown that 46% of infected persons would, would never be detected by screening at an airport, uh, at a border. This was looking at temperature screening, um, symptom screening, which is usually done with temperatures. The, the problem is, of course, if you, it takes a few days for you to develop a temperature, uh, you know, five or six days. So if you, if you travel on day zero, day one, day two, day three, day four, you don't get picked up. Contact tracing. The um, Professor Sir Chris Whitty asked in January um, for an investigation to be carried out into whether or not that would be effective. The London School of Hygiene produced a number of papers which they put online and then they published, I think, on, in the Lancet. Yeah. Let's have a look at that Lancet Health Article 212222. I think this is the same one as before with Joel Helliwell, is it? It's the one to which you were a contrib well, you were a contributor. Two one two 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 two. Feasibility of controlling COVID nineteen outbreaks by isolation of cases and contacts. The findings, if we could scroll in on thank you very much. There is a description of the consequences or the analysis of simulated outbreaks. But essentially, without going into the detail of that paragraph, what that data or what that analysis showed it, is that in order to be effective, contact tracing has to pick up a very large percentage, an overwhelming percentage of, of the people who are the contacts in order to work. Correct. Was the fraction of contacts which have to be picked up to make it work as high as 70 to 80 percent? It's very difficult to tell um, because, of course, by, almost by definition, you don't pick up the contacts you then pick up. Yeah? But there are clever ways that you can get to that. And actually, later in the epidemic, when Test and Trace was launched, it was uh, one of the things we, I myself kept raising with Test and Trace was to try and put these measures in and uh, to see whether to, to see what fraction uh, of the contacts were being missed. Um, but at that time, it was impossible to tell. Sporting events. This was analysed by uh, CCMID, the London School of Hygiene um, Research Institute or Centre. Uh, as well as SAGE, could we have 212210? This is dated the 11th of March, page one. The impact of banning sporting events and other leisure activities on the COVID-19 epidemic, prepared on behalf of the CMMID COVID-19 modelling team. Did it essentially conclude that banning mass gatherings would be unlikely to, to have a great deal of impact? When looked at in the whole of the epidemic. So we were, we were I think this is a kind of example of where um, there was a kind of over-reliance on modeling. Um, so yes, attending a sporting event would be you know, more risky than staying at home. Of course, yeah. But that, actually, if it's outside, that risk was probably quite low, although we didn't know it. But at the population level, stopping sporting events is not really going to do very much because um, we'd found, I'd found, uh, one as a Google, I'd found some attendance data, um, how, many, how many times, what the global attendance, 
the entire attendance of sporting events in the UK in, I think, 2018 or 2019, I can't remember. And it was something like 75 million um, ticket holders, as it were, 75 million uh, attendances at sporting events of, of every type, whether it's the cricket or the football or Wimbledon or whatever it might be. And if you think about it, there's 67 million of us, roughly. So that means, on average, on average, we attend about one sporting event per year. And so if you stop the sporting events, is that going to stop the virus? Well, no, um, because it's going to make a tiny impact on the total number of contacts that we make. Throwing, so that, throwing it's been described as a lit match on a raging fire. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... But, at the, but that's looking at it at the population level. So, and, of course, that's what we do. We are modelling things at the population level. Um, whereas, actually, at the individual level, maybe it's not a good idea to go to a sporting event in a, in a pandemic. So for an individual, um, you know, sensible public health advice might be to say, well, don't go. But that doesn't mean to say it's going to have a big impact on the epidemic. It, it wouldn't. And so in answer to a question that, that in fact, my lady put to an, an earlier witness, if you attend a mass gathering event, there is a risk you will become infected, and it's a risk that you wouldn't otherwise have run. Yes and no. It depends what you would do if you hadn't have gone to the event. But so if you'd have gone to the pub instead, then maybe the risk in the pub was greater than being at the event. If the event is a, sorry, outside... All right. But at a micro level... There is obviously a risk for the individual. Yes. But if you look at it on a population modelling level, there is a tendency, isn't there, to overlook the significance of that risk? Because at the population level, it's tiny. It, it, it makes a tiny contribution to the entire... Yeah, your analogy is a very good one. And so, in truth, by relying upon modelling in order to answer the question, should we ban mass gatherings... It's the wrong... You're asking the wrong group of people. You're you, should just, you should just take a decision about it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot... This is, a, you know... There's, there's lots of reasons why you, my, my, why you might want to do it, even though it might not have an effect or a very small effect at the population level. One, we just talked about an individual risk. Two is the optics. It doesn't necessarily look good. Uh, you know, imagine the situation if we'd had our schools closed and and the football was still going on I, I don't think anybody would have accepted that they would have it would have looked a bit strange and in terms of the precautionary principle to which you referred earlier there was obviously a good argument for banning mass gathering events yes even though i think and we did work on it later actually I, it's something we did some work on later in the epidemic and it did show that actually the risk is really quite small um, you've referred to the fact that modelers were um, handicapped to some extent by the delays in, in, in originally or initially receiving data from China and understanding that data. And then towards the end of February and the beginning of March, the delays that you, of which you spoke in relation to the delays between testing and getting the data to you in terms of delays in people getting tested or testing the right number of people or getting an understanding of who was infected. You, you raised with SAGE, didn't you, on the 13th of March, your concerns about how these significant delays were impacting your ability to model efficiently. We'll just have a look at that, 212212. Page one shows 13th of March. The second page, paragraph one, this is the, the, the date on which yeah. SAGE says, we now believe that there are more cases in the United Kingdom than SAGE currently expected. Paragraph seven, we may be further ahead on the epidemic curve. Yeah. The change in numbers is due to the day, five to seven day lag phase in data av availability for modeling. So you in essence, said to Sage, we've been undone, that there's been a, a delay in getting data to us, 
But now that we've got a better understanding, our situational awareness is better, we can now see we're further ahead on the curve than we thought we were. We always thought there would be a delay because, of course, there is. Nothing's, you know, it takes time for the data to come in, of course. Um, but that was the first time we'd been able to estimate it, and that was the average delay. Some, some individuals on the database, the delays between them was up to three weeks. And so, um, yes, it, with uh, having estimate, it was two bits of work that we were doing that week. If I'm, I don't know if you want the details of it or not. I don't think we need to trouble you okay. for, for the detail of the work. The, the, the main point is you were working very hard on the modelling, but the it output... It was much worse. There was two bits. There was this, which was... And we used to start SAGE meetings... Um, with a quick update, like a one-minute update from Chris Whitty or Jonathan Van Tam on just on the numbers of cases that had been reported. And, of course, those cases, because of this delay, those cases hadn't actually been become a case uh, on that day that we were getting reported. They'd actually become a case a week earlier. Um, and so what we were... What, you know, Chris was reporting on was what was happening a week earlier. And it's worse than that if you think about it, because it takes about five or six days between getting infected and becoming a case. And so actually we were being, you know, I, I thought that we were being lulled into a bit of a false sense of security here in that actually the numbers of cases, because what we were being report, what was being reported on was infections that had happened perhaps two weeks earlier. All right. And that's just the ones we knew about because for all the asymptomatic infections... Or even just cases that had come through different routes, because we were still... To, to be tested, you had to... There had to be a reason for you to be tested and to become a case, as it were. And that was you had to have symptoms, but you also had to have come from a high-risk area, China, Singapore, a few, mostly other places in, in the Far East initially. Um, and so... We weren't testing people who had symptoms that hadn't come from there initially. That did, we did put systems in place at the end of February that would, that would give an idea of, of infections, in the community, infections in the community. And they immediately picked up a case, uh, cases. So that, sporadic. These were the sporadic ones. All right, I'm going to pause you there because we, we've got to move on to other topics. So in summary... Professor, by this time, the beginning of February... No, this, is, that, this is March. Well, uh, sorry, I meant to say March. In fact, the 13th of March. Yeah. You've told us that by, by the end of January, the broad nature of the threat was known. By February, mid-February, the broad nature of the, the, the possible fatalities and hospitalizations and infections were known. The modelling process and the enormous amount of work dedicated to trying to bottom out the figures and get a, get a proper handle on the nature of this pandemic continued. And then at the beginning of March, SAGE was blindsided by the discovery that, that not only, as you've described, was there no effective means of containing the virus, and not only the virus was as deadly as it was, but that it had spread through the United Kingdom far further than anyone had realised. Yeah, by picking up these sporadic cases, they were not linked to importations or anything like that. And so hopefully we'd have seen no, none of them. And this, by no means were we picking up every sporadic case. It was This was like a sieve with huge holes in it. But... Um, uh, there was two systems, you can think of two sibs, mostly holes and very little. Professor, I'm... I'm uh, but we, to... but by the, at this point, so we should have seen none, and of course we did start to see them. So, And we were trying to work out from the growth of those. And so at this point, we, it, it really was apparent that there was far, far more... Not just had the, uh, was the infection spreading, but it was spreading much more uh, widespread than than I th all of us hoped. Uh, right. So it was, uh, we were in big trouble. The, 
would the full application of the precautionary principle in February, based upon the understanding of how fatal or damaging the virus was, have allowed the government, the country as a whole, not to have to wait to find out how far the epidemic had spread before realising that action and severe action was absolutely necessary. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what we what would have been a proportionate response in February. That's um, right. uh, of course. I wish we had taken more action in February, um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure what would have been proportionate when the cases would have been very, very, very low. But in reality, nothing was done in February other than a fairly low-level surveillance on travellers. So we were concentrating on, on the kind of trying to pick cases up coming from overseas, and we were concentrating, of course, on the places where we knew there was transmission, and there was always a risk that transmission was happening somewhere else, which indeed it was. In fact, we imported most of our cases from Italy and France and Spain in the early parts, and we were not looking uh, there initially, at least. Was that predominantly also the half-term break This was after, break yeah, in exactly, fact. skiing, holidays and, and the like. And just because of the, just the travel, how much travel there is between, between our countries. On the 3rd of March, a report was prepared for SAGE 21223 by the LSH TM CMM ID team, yeah. which set out in very clear terms what the likely deaths would be. Possible. I mean, this is but these are I possibles and these are scenarios. Professor, yeah. forgive me, I hadn't finished the. I'm afraid I was just taking my time in, in formulating the question, what the likely death would be if social distancing measures were not applied. It was a classic scenario model. What might happen if something is not done or only something else is done? And And... The report showed to Sage, did it not? We can see from the results in the middle of the page. An unmitigated epidemic is expected to result in 570,000 deaths in England, result in a peak demand of almost a million non-ICU beds, 130,000 ICU beds at peak. Closure of schools is estimated to be the, less, the least effective of these policies. Cocooning of the elderly, general social distances, and case isolation are all estimated to reduce deaths by about 25%. Social distancing reduces peak demand on hospital services more than the other strategies. The combination of school closure and social distancing, a reduction of about 75% in beds, 32% in deaths. The combination, that's to say all of them, would reduce demand by about 75% and reduces death by about half. So, again, this was not an alarmist production, was it? No, this was just what you would get from those scenarios. I mean, obviously, the worst case, the unmitigated one, I, I can't imagine it would ever have happened. We must have, we must have taken action at some point, but... Um, and, and, of course, it doesn't take into account, and this is important, it doesn't take into account spontaneous behaviour change because we had no way of estimating what that might be, what that might... We'd never done anything like this before. And in previous epidemics, because I did measure contact patterns in the 2009 pandemic, people didn't change their behaviour at all. Obviously, it was low risk. So, so it doesn't take into account spontaneous behaviour change, which would have probably happened, but there's no way we could predict Estimate that. that. And it didn't take into account, of course, well, it, it didn't say... It, it projected one outcome of what might happen if these steps were taken individually or in combination. And, and you know, I, I regard these as, uh, as I said before, I think these are broad sketches of what might happen rather than precise 
uh, but they were huge numbers. You know, that huge, was the huge numbers. And this this report set out in clear terms, did it not, that the NHS would be overwhelmed if there's no certain way measures. you can cope with that sort of level of demand. Uh, okay. You know, and this was plainly brought to the attention of Sage, of course. It was consistent, wasn't it, with the outcome of Professor Riley's reports and also Professor Neil Ferguson's reports of a few days later. Yeah, Professor Riley's were less detailed than this, so I would I would say that it was more consistent with with Neil Ferguson's estimates. Um, and broad, and if you compare the two, they're, 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 there are differences, um, but broadly they're kind of in the same ballpark. Your report notably or rather the CCMMID report, notably it doesn't get into the conceptual debate of suppression or mitigation. Professor Riley's and Professor Ferguson's do. There are references to that. They, they, were, done late, they, they were done later. Those, this was very early March as opposed to sort of mid-March. To what extent did any debate about reasonable worst-case scenario, whether a response was mitigation or suppression, whether or not herd immunity was good or bad, assist in understanding these basic thoughts, which is, unless practical measures are taken, the deaths are going to be huge. Yeah, that's the simple message. Do you and we were, we were not alone in this. So Neil and Steve, their work was similar. And other people were doing similar things elsewhere, not just in the UK. But that we were all... It all pointed to extremely... You know, you know, the sort of situation that I don't think anybody could possibly just let happen. Did those debates about what was a reasonable worst-case scenario? Was it going to happen? Are we suppressing or mitigating? Need to be resolved in order for SAGE to be able to say to the government, there is this massive problem coming. I guess there's one thing saying there's a problem. It's better to come with a solution. And I don't think we had the solution. I don't think we had the solution at that time. So we were looking at these sort of measures you can see, I mean, even with these measures uh, and combinations of these measures, it, it, it still looked horrendous. The but, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you were looking at measures. You weren't engaging here in a polemic about whether it's suppression or mitigation or a reasonable worst-case scenario. You were focusing on what practically needs to be done. Yeah. All right. And it was more than this, in my view. The government, as proved to be the case, as the government had already produced a report on the 3rd of March, a, a coronavirus action plan, of which a major part, the first stage, was contained. Was that a publication of which you had become aware prior to its publication? No, I mean, those sorts of strategy documents um, that the government published periodically over the course of the epidemic um, of which that was the first one. Uh, we didn't see those before before they came out. What was your reaction on on seeing that the government's future strategy, because it was a mm. document produced for what we should happen going forward, what was your reaction on seeing that an element, the first element, was containment? Yeah, I, I genuinely... <laughs> I mean, it would have made more sense for that to have come out a month earlier. Um, at that time, I, we, I know we were officially still in the containment phase, I think. But, you know, the, as I say, from these sporadic cases, you could see there was, we, were, we hadn't contained the virus, um, you know, at that, at that point. Um, so there was that. The other, there isn't a lot of, detail in that document as well. So it, it, it talk, it's very general. It doesn't really say what really we, we would do. And maybe that was fine because I don't think that had been worked out, but it, it was a very kind of high level um, document. 
bluntly, Professor, the ship had sailed. There was and could be no containment. The virus was rife in the population. Rife, I don't think is right yet. I mean, this, are we talking about third, the 3rd of March? It was certainly here, it was certainly spreading. Um, and this was the work that we were trying to do. Actually, later than this, it was around the 8th of March when we were looking at these sporadic cases and trying to work out how many, what was the scale of the epidemic, because the reported cases was not reflecting that by any means. All right. Uh, so we didn't really know the scale of it, although the very fact that we picked up these sporadic cases was an alarm bell. In your statement, you say, recognising that some observers have indicated that SAGE appeared to be too slow to recommend action during the early weeks of the epidemic, that you have some sympathy with this view and, and that you had become increasingly anxious yourself. Absolutely. Is that because you say that this understanding of the sheer number of deaths and hospitalizations and the impact on the health care system in the United Kingdom should have been understood earlier? Or I mean, it was, I mean, everybody, I mean, I, I saw you into, well, Mark Woolhouse's uh, evidence from a few days ago. And, you know, he did this sort of simple back of the envelope calculation based on the reproduction number. This is, and he'd done it back in January based on the reproduction number and uh, guesstimates of case fatality ratio and come with very big numbers. We'd all done the same calculations back in January and early February. This was the, this and when and Neil's, Neil was, Ferguson was doing the same, you know, in parallel doing, looking at similar things. Uh, this was when we had kind of, it had gone through the formal modelling kind of process and those numbers were coming out and they were, they were truly horrendous. And that should have been understood earlier is what you're saying in your statement. So I think uh, I brought, it, if you want, so we didn't know if there was a, the, the, the last piece of the jigsaw was related to hospitalisation. It was difficult to understand exactly what fraction of people would be hospitalised because in the early days, particularly in East Asia and even here as well, um, early cases were hospitalised whether they needed it or not. So they were hospitalised for public health measure reasons so that they wouldn't spread. This was in the containment phase, yeah? All right. So it was difficult then to know exactly what fraction would need to be hospitalised for clinical ground, on clinical grounds and how long they would have to be hospitalised for and what fraction might need intensive care. So that was the last bit of the jigsaw. I mean, you could get a guesstimate at it, and, a reason, and as February moved on, that, that, that became more clear. But we didn't have a, a I would say we didn't, we didn't have a, a solid estimate of it until uh, really that meeting on the 1st of March, on the Sunday of the 1st of March, when we really we had a, a meeting with colleagues at... Uh, Oxford, Imperial, obviously, and the NHS. Uh, and then we got a, a much clearer idea. So that was the final bit of that jigsaw. But you didn't really need the whole jigsaw. I mean, you could see the picture was pretty obvious from, from, from you know, much before then. That's a perfect moment. I'm afraid we're not going to complete you today. I, uh, but, but, sorry, today we'll complete you. Thank but you. Uh, this morning, um, I hope you're warned that you might go over lunch with yeah, Professor Edmonds. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. We'll return, I will return at two o'clock.
If Professor Edmonds will forgive me, I'll just deal with the case management matter. Forgive me, Professor Edmonds, just it won't take very long. At some stage, I have to decide the issue of whether to publish the notes made by Sir Patrick Vallance, government chief scientific advisor and one of the two main scientific advisors to the government during the worst stages of the pandemic. To date, the extracts from his notes put to witnesses have been read into the record and not brought up on screen in the hearing or published as extracts. For other documents, the whole page has been displayed and then published, even if the extract referred to is only a small part of the page. Lawyers representing Sir Patrick have objected to a proposal from the inquiry team to adopt the same process as is adopted for other documents uh, in relation to Sir Patrick Valance's notes and to publish the whole of the relevant page or pages on screen. They claim that this would be a breach of his Article 8 rights and of his legitimate expectation of privacy. Eight media organisations supported by some of the core participants argue that it is in the public interest to publish the whole page and that restricting publication of the notes would breach Article 10 of the European Convention. Issues arise in relation to Sir Patrick Valance's notes said to be of an entirely private nature that do not arise in relation to other documents provided to the inquiry. And I must consider those issues very carefully. Further, I note that I may well face calls for publication of all the notes at some stage if I haven't done so already. The issues of publishing the whole page upon which an extract appears and publishing the whole of the notes are inextricably linked. In my view, therefore, it would be premature to decide the first issue now. I wish to see how the notes are used and the extent of the use. I also wish to hear much fuller submissions on the principal issue of conducting the difficult balancing exercise of Sir Patrick's Article 8 rights and the rights under Article 10. The time for preparation of and presentation of submissions at the short hearing on Monday was extremely limited and therefore the advocates did not have, in my view, sufficient opportunity to address the principal issue in much detail, if at all. I have decided, therefore, that for the time being, we shall adopt the practical approach of bringing up the relevant extracts being put to a witness on screen, but not the full page. The extracts will then be published following the day's hearing. We shall proceed on this basis until the resolution of the substantive issue. For documents other than Sir Patrick Valance's notes, we shall continue to display and publish the whole page or pages subject only to redactions for sensitive and or irrelevant private material. I acknowledge the concerns expressed by some about ensuring that all the most significant passages in the notes are put to witnesses when necessary, and I rely on counsel to the inquiry and to the core participants to ensure that that happens. I too shall be monitoring the situation. I shall also keep under review whether or not the passages upon which the advocates wish to place reliance should be put into greater context by publishing larger sections of the text. Thank you. Thank you, Milady. Professor, during the course of the morning, you mentioned the reassuring nature of the messages being put out by government, particularly in late February, early March. Did you attend a nerve tag uh, meeting I think on the 21st of February, where there was a debate about whether or not 
the risk assessment from Public Health England should be elevated from moderate to high. Yes, it was on Skype for business, and for some reason I couldn't make myself heard. All right, and, well, well... But I heard the discussion, and afterwards I emailed my points to the Secretariat. Could we have, please, 119469, paragraph 5, page 5, paragraph 2.4. PH, is that Peter Horby? Yes. Ask the committee if anyone thought that the Public Health England risk assessment should change. No objections were raised. However, after the meeting, John Edmonds emailed to say that he was online but for some technical reason couldn't be heard. He believes that the risk to the UK population in the PHE risk assessment should be high as there is evidence of ongoing transmission in Korea, Japan and Singapore as well as in China. You needn't deal in detail with how the PHE risk assessment process works because the inquiry has already had evidence about that. In short, however, at that stage it was at moderate and it, it indicates, does it not, what the exact risk is on that day. It's not a prospective forward-looking exercise, it's at that time. And you believe that as at that time on the 21st of February, the risk was high. I thought the risk was high. I, I thought there was a little bit of... Um, I thought the risk was about to be very high, and I just didn't think... I thought this was sending out the wrong message if we said that it was, that it was moderate. And around this time, in, in fact, about a week or so later, and we'll see your emails at the beginning of March, you, you began t to form the view, did you not, that, you, that we, SAGE, had to take much more radical measures, or perhaps the government had to take much more radical measures to mitigate the epidemic. Yes. Could we have, please, 212036 on the screen? It's a 12th of March email. If we can go down to the... Uh, if we can go to the next page and an email at... I think maybe one more page to 22, 22. Yes, thank you very much. Towards the pop, top of the page at around about half past 10 on Thursday the 12th of March from John Edmonds. The data are crap and hopelessly out of date, so we have little situational awareness. The daily figures are a joke, and the guesstimate of five to 10,000 cases is probably too low. The measure has just announced but those are the measures announced by the government. We'll do very little. Not quite sure just how many cases will escape, but I suspect a fair few. We will have to do a lot more to manage this epidemic. The current plans will overwhelm the NHS almost straight away. We need much more stringent control measures if we want to slow it down. Not necessarily now, but soon. Very soon. We'll come back to the issue about waves and autumn and winter epidemics and lowering the peak in a moment. So you, you, you plainly raised the alarm there. And, and if we look, please, at 2120... Uh, sorry, no, perhaps if we could go back to the, the, the second page, we can see that the, the debate develops between yourself and Professor Ferguson and, and, and Professor Farah, or Jeremy Farah, you, you debate what NHS England is likely to say on the issue of whether it can cope. And then if you go back, please, to the first page. This is the email that um, Milady Professor Ferguson was asked about. I think the message got across. I still think part of the issue is Chris is hoping it won't be as bad as we say. So between you, you're, you're essentially debating the the emergency, whether or not the government understands the position, and, and of course, what can be done. If we look at 212037, <coughs> you debate right at the top of the page. It's, it commences with the same email string, but, but it, it, um, it's a different string. Apologies. 
<laughs> don't apologise. If you if we could scroll back out, perhaps, and go to the second page, we'll see there an email from Jeremy Farrer. Are you both comfortable with the plans the United Kingdom government have, have got? It says not, but we, we think it's got in place. The pace of actions and the changes they're making. Good if we can talk again before SAGE. Back one page, please. John Emmons, no, I am not. Jeremy Farrer, main concerns, then the, the data are crap. Email, and then back up the page. Neil Ferguson emails about the actual surge capacity of the NHS. And is that to the point that you were addressing earlier about what the impact would be on the NHS of these figures and, of course, whether there was a surge capacity to be able to deal with it? It was never very clear what the surge capacity was, but in my mind, whatever it was, it wasn't going to be able to cope with the kind of numbers we were talking with, about. And the, is that why you therefore say at the top of the page the potential surge capacity is absolute bollocks? It's a level of demand at the peak, even with the mitigations planned, are an order of magnitude higher than the NHS can cope with. Yeah. And... In this trilogy of emails, all with the same genesis, 212038. The debate continues between the three of you about whether or not the Prime Minister and Health Secretary are more aware of what's coming, but there's still a lack of urgency in some quarters. Professor Ferguson says, I think we might push for rapid contingency planning for potential escalation of social distancing, likely cessation of all out-of-home leisure activity, working from home where possible, school closure. Oh, and surveillance is a mess, so we don't really know what's happening. That's a fair summary. That's what we were talking about at the time, yeah. Um, the debate between yourselves and also at SAGE at that point focused to some extent also on what the consequences would be of trying to completely suppress what you knew to be the first wave of the pandemic. Is that right? And on, on what the dangers would be thereafter of suppressing a wave, whether it would come back as an uncalled spring yeah. and so on. And Sage debated whether or not um, the measures which would have to be contemplated would have the result of completely suppressing a wave in a way which meant that it would bounce back later. I've mixed my metaphors, but you understand. Yeah, the but that, that was the concern, yeah. Um, Mr. Halpern, who is the director of the Behavioural Insight team at the, in the Cabinet Office at 2188731, page 16, paragraph 73, comments on the nature of that debate. He says... During the meeting, and he's referring to, to um, a meeting of SAGE, Stephen Powis and Patrick Valance questioned the modelers on why they were so sure that suppression of the virus was not viable. The response from Graham Medley and John Edmonds was that suppression was not viable because as soon as the lockdown was lifted, the virus would spike back up, implying there was no point. Graham Medley and John Emmons both stated they were 100% sure of th about this. This gave me great concern, and he expresses, his, expresses the observation that this may have indicated an overconfidence in the model, and so on. Was Sage clear that if the wave was to be, the first wave was to be suppressed, Inevitably, there would be a second wave. It would re-emerge like an uncalled spring and have the obvious consequences. Yes, because um, uh, 
there was no if you just you know stop the stop the circulation of the virus for a while and then stopped doing that of course it would come back there was no 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 kind of magic about it so especially if we um implemented a lockdown relatively early which is what we were talking about here um then you wouldn't have a lot of immunity in the population it would be there would be very few in the population who would be immune so the when the epidemic came back which it, it surely would um and let yeah it surely would then um it would it would increase then at more or less the same rate as before because there would there be very few people who were in, immune what we didn't anticipate was the the huge changes in behavior that that you know we couldn't predict the behavior changes um so uh were we right that it would bounce back well clearly we were because it did uh, and it not just did it do it here but it did it everywhere because you know, everyone who did it and then eased the restrictions it came back so were we right as a in the big picture yes i think it came back slower than i was anticipating and i think possibly many of us because we didn't know how behavior would change when restrictions i think everybody expected when you know the pubs were opened again they'd be packed and they weren't and is it out of this debate about what the consequences would be of suppression of the first wave that the debate on herd immunity emerged because another way of going about it would be not to completely suppress the wave in a way that allows it to spring back up but to manage it so that some part of the population might having become infected have immunity and and therefore the consequences would be less severe in terms of the magnitude of the second wave i mean obviously these are related issues and we would have discussed them together i don't i don't yeah i don't see ex the exact link between those two things but yeah it's in that th we were we were discussing these things of course yeah and and was it your view and sir patrick vance in his evening notes believes that it that it was that you were saying but if you if you mitigate if you don't completely suppress there is this possibility of some degree of herd immunity it is a byproduct of mitigation exactly so um eventually uh then then people will become immune uh through those mitigation policies which is what we were concentrating on at the time in the event the impact the likely impact upon the nhs required of course the full maximum lockdown oh, yes but we were it was so urgent uh you know the the pressure um projecting forward you could see that there was that the that the nhs would come under severe strain very quickly and so action had to be taken and although it's an extreme action uh you know and you know in many respects regrettable i think it was a necessary evil and in order to be able to to answer the conundrum as to how if you imposed a complete suppression you would have a a wave which would then reemerge later if you if you just released the, that if you released yeah. it and because there was a recognition that it would be extremely difficult to maintain a full suppression lockdown for any real length of time as you describe in your statement the sage and 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 the the london school of hygiene team and yourself came up with a potential solution which was to have or try to put into place a a series of background social distancing measures which would over time dampen down the level of incidence and have periodic lockdowns to try to bring the top level the peak down whenever it was required that that was the i thought i thought we were kind of in a uh, we were stuck between two dreadful alternatives one being this sort of mitigation policy that would still result in a huge wave uh and huge numbers of deaths uh versus the other one which you know these things were talked at rather in a very polar way at the time and i actually still are versus the other one which was we just go into lockdown and we stay there and of course till when i mean and so the you had to do that until you 
you were gambling then on a vaccine being available. So it was kind of an open-ended, uh, open-ended lockdown. Both of those seem to me pretty dreadful uh, alternatives, but for very different reasons. And just focusing and, on... And so this was, I thought, an, a, one way of trying to manage the epidemic that wasn't in, in either of those two extremes. And just dealing with one of those options, the herd immunity issue, in, in outline, is, is one of the market downsides of a herd immunity approach, or, or rather an approach which has herd immunity as a byproduct, that A, if you allow the virus to, to flood through any part of the population, there will be deaths. Absolutely. Secondly, practically, it's extremely difficult to hermetically seal off that other part of the population yeah. who you don't wish to be infected. Yeah, I thought that segmentation type of approach, which I can't remember was discussed, yeah, had been slightly, just, I didn't think that was ever, ever going to be uh, reasonable. All right. And we therefore come, of course, to the decision of the government to, to lock down. And, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you for your views on the government's decision making, because that, that was a matter for government. And, and as you've rightly said, bar raising the warnings and raising the alarm and telling it how it was, telling the government how it was, it wasn't Sage's role to say, this is what you must do, balancing all these terrible factors. But as a matter of scientific analysis, do you say in your statement that the 16th of March was the first feasible date that a decision to go into lockdown could have been announced in a way that was consistent with the scientific knowledge that had then emerged and, and could have been justified by virtue of that knowledge? I, I, oh, I thought that that was the date. By that time, we had enough data to... We knew we had seen a glimpse at how bad it was in terms of uh, the cases, how, you know, so I think it was the first date where you could have made an, a, a, it could have been backed up by the evidence. You could, of course, have made a decision before. Many countries did go into lockdown um, without reams of epidemiological data and modelling advice and so on. But I think, uh, so it's, it's certainly possible to do that. Uh, many countries did. Um, but I think if you wanted to make evidence-informed decision-making, I think it took us to about that time, about that meeting of the 13th of March, to have the evidence to say, this, you know, this is where we are. There was, after the uh, first wave, in fact, in the autumn, a, a meeting of SAGE, I think a, a, a what, what did we get wrong, if anything, meeting to use a terrible modern expression, a wash-up. And, and at that meeting, did, did you say to, to your colleagues that perhaps too much time had been spent by Sage worrying about the second peak and, and the debate about the flattening strategy? Yes, I, I felt uh, there was a huge wave of infections just around the corner, and that's what we needed to deal with not worry too much about what may or may not happen in the winter. Turning to the aftermath of the lockdown and, and the, the exit, rather, from it, um, I want to ask you some questions about the position in the care home sector. The epidemic in the care home sector was obviously recognised at the time, and, and rightly so. Um, to what extent was the risk to the care home sector, and, and also actually hospitals, obvious to SAGE as it deliberated on what measures, control measures, might be necessary in order to control this incipient wave of infection? It was very clear from early on that the most elderly and most frail uh, uh, members of our society were the most were at most risk, and so it was obvious that that there needed to be measures to somehow protect them. 
uh, whether it was care home residents or people in the community. I was extremely worried about people who were very old and frail and living in the community as well. Um, but also, uh, um, you know, hospital patients who are also very vulnerable in, in, in often. Um, so, yeah, all of this was known, was a con major concern. In April, on the 20th of April, we party to an email string from... Professor Medley, from whom the inquiry has heard, to Sir Patrick Valance, in which concern was expressed about the care home sector and the need, possible need for some dramatic measures. And was there at the same time active consideration by NERVTAG of what measures might be necessary in order to better protect the care sector? We were discussing it, yes. Um, you know, it, yeah, in reflection, I, I really wish we'd discussed some of these matters before. How much, how much of it was a scientific... We were scientific committees, how much of it was scientific and how much of it was operational. So I think most of it was operational, really. Um, but there were, issue, there were scientific issues around, for instance, testing. Uh, you know, would that, would that offer... How much better protected would different testing regimes be? And so on. So... I, there were things for us to consider and, and to go through, um, which we were working through. In general terms, did you believe that the easing of restrictions, which took place, of course, over a matter of weeks, May, June and July, took, um, occurred too early? I was very concerned around that time, around the end of May, Partly because of what I explained before, we didn't know how quickly this, what you'd call a coiled spring, would bounce back. Um, and we were relying very heavily on an organisation that hadn't, uh, was being created at the time, Test and Trace. Uh, and I thought, I was very worried that it wouldn't be able to, that it, it, had, it had to work so perfectly, so, you know, straight away from day one, that that, that worried me. At the time, we had wonderful data by then. Uh, the ONS survey had been set up, so we knew the level of prevalence in the community. And I think in my statement, I said that around that time, around a mark, end, of mark, uh, end of May, it was about one in, in 600, I think. And so that amounts to about 100,000 people who would test positive in, in, in the country. I thought that was a, an awful lot of people to test and trace, potentially. So. Yes, I was very nervous that uh, that that by opening up then um, that test and trace might get overwhelmed and the cases might start to uh, climb quickly. As it turns out, they, they climbed much more slowly, thankfully. The way in which restrictions were lifted and, and their timing was, of course, a, a decision for the government. Um, but did it become apparent from the end of July that there was a trend upwards in the cases. So yes. the incidence, the level of incidence, the spread that the number of infections had been brought right down by the lockdown. Yeah. It was at a relatively low level at the end of the restrictions, but it wasn't low enough to stop the trend and the level coming back. Well, you only need one case. Um, and, you know, we didn't, we brought it down to a, a very low level. It was about one in 3,000, if I remember rightly, um, something around that, which is very low. So many communities would have had zero cases, for instance, many um, at, that, at that point. We, and we never, we have never, even to this day, got the incidents or the numbers of anywhere close to that level. So it, we had pushed it to a very low level. And, um, but then, of course, it did start coming it started increasing straight away. So when the, I, I was watching the case numbers, as you can imagine, it's sort of my job. Um, and the final, it was, it, was, it was the 4th of July, there was this sort of Freedom Day was the 4th of July, you know. And the cases started coming up on kind of the 5th of July. And at the end of July, did you write to the government I chief did. scientific advisor, 228590? Yeah. 
I may have unfairly called for an, a document which I hadn't, in fact, told our uh, brilliant support staff that um, I was going to. In any event, you wrote to the government's chief scientific advisor on the 27th of July, um, essentially saying the trend is back up, yeah. cases are rising. And in August, don't worry, you can take it off, off the screen, thank you. In, in August, uh, the, the Treasury launched the Eat Out to Help Out um, campaign. I'm not going to ask you questions about the, the overall merits of it. The, the, the Treasury has a, a number of points and issues and arguments that they would probably deploy in support of that scheme. But in terms of the public impact of that scheme, in terms of the overarching necessity to apply a precautionary approach of the type that you described earlier, were you concerned about that scheme? Um, to be honest, it made me angry, and I'm still angry about it. Um, uh, it was one thing taking your foot off the brake, which is what we've been doing by easing the restrictions, but to put the foot on the accelerator seemed to me uh, perverse, and to spend public money to do that when 45,000 people had just died. I couldn't, you know, I, I don't want to blame he, Eat Out to help out for the second wave, because that's not the case. But the, just, the, just the optics of it were, were terrible, I just thought. And, and really, it's dis my, my feeling was, yes, I, I, the pub and restaurant sector really needed support. I'm not, um, I wasn't against that at all. They did need a, a great deal of support, but this was not really just supporting them. They could have just given them money. This was a scheme to encourage people to take an epidemiological risk. It only applied if you went into the restaurant and ate in the restaurant. It didn't take apply out, to take out. didn't, no. You have now mentioned the issue of whether or not epidemiologically it contributed to a rise in infection in the areas where people were taking up the scheme in large numbers. Um, so, and, uh, and to make perfectly, to make it clear, there is very little or there's only weak epidemiological evidence to show that infections in the areas in which people took up the scheme went up significantly. Your point is about the optics of it. Exactly. And Chain, trying to change it? people's behaviour. And we were measuring people's behaviour at the time, and there was a change in people's behaviour in August. And um, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it was eat out to help out, but it was contributing. It was all part of. I mean, government messaging, messaging more generally was about getting back to normal and getting. Uh, going back to work and uh, and so on. On the 10th of September, you were asked by SAGE to chair a working group to review where essentially we'd got to in terms of the reintroduction of possible further new non-pharmaceutical interventions. And did you report to SAGE and produce a paper on basically what might need to be done to try to re-reduce, to lower the level of incidence, which by then had gone up? Yes, the incidence was going up very clearly. Um, Hospitalisations had started to go up. Unfortunately, we were starting to get outbreaks in care homes again. And um, so, you know, something needed to be done, in the classic phrase. Um, and. I remember Chris actually initially saying, come up with a batting order. I remember his very phrase. Uh, and so I was asked to put this, put, put this report together on the... T I was asked on the 10th. I brought it back to the SAGE meeting a week later where we got a lot of discussion and input from many SAGE members and then further discussion and input over the weekend of the... around the 20th. And it went back to SAGE as a sort of... for a final sign-off. It was a special sage, actually, uh, just just to look at this on the let's, 21st, on the Monday, the 21st. Let's have a look. 212102, please. Uh, 
the heart of it is in paragraph two. In essence, but because COVID-19 incidence is increasing across the country in all age groups, that's in paragraph one, a package of interventions will need to be adopted to reverse this exponential rise in cases. Single interventions by themselves are unlikely to be able to bring our back, uh, I interpose that word, in back below one, the short list of NPIs that should be considered for immediate introduction includes a circuit breaker, advice to work from home for, for all those that can, banning all contact within the home with members of other households except within a support bubble, closure of all bars, restaurants, cafes, indoor gyms and so on, all the university and college teaching to be online unless face-to-face -face teaching is absolutely essential. So a relatively stringent package, you make it absolutely plain that it's for immediate, bless you, immediate introduction and single interventions are unlikely to work on their own. Correct. There's two aspects to this. Please. Um, so uh, one, the circuit break, it, this all got, this got, came just the circuit break, breaker. The circuit breaker was about reducing the prevalence and bringing it to a low level. Because the only way that we'd, you know, when we had been in the lockdown in March, April, then we, we, we reduced the incidence, we reduced the prevalence. Um, and that's what that was designed to do, to bring the incidence right down again. And the other measures, which were for a longer term, were to slow the growth. So that was, so that was there's two aspects to it, is what I'm trying to say. It, it's very well known that, of course, very little of this happened, or at least yeah. happened in the immediate future after, after that meeting of, of SAGE. Um, around about the same time, ab about, um, well, in fact, the, the, the day before SAGE signed off on this, yeah. and this is a, an extract from the minutes of that 58th meeting of SAGE on the 21st of September, the day before, you, you'd been asked to attend a meeting with the Prime Minister on that Sunday. Um, you were invited to attend in order to address a particular question that the Prime Minister wished to, to be debated. Um, I think in email 212107, you were told that there would be a balanced group of views presented. So there's a... It's from Julian Fletcher at the bottom, I think. Isn't yes, it? Yeah. He, he's the official in the Cabinet Office. And then you receive the invitation and, and you forward it to Sir Patrick Vallance um, talking about the, the main SAGE paper that was due. Of course, it was due the following day on the Monday. And then he replies this at 11.16 on the Saturday. John, the meeting is for him to hear a range of views on the forward look, mainly from the Let It Rip Brigade. We've tried to put together a balanced group across views, so I think what he needs is your view on future direction of the epidemic rather than policy options. What did you understand his reference to the Let It Rip Brigade be? Well, of course, there were many people, well, not that many, but there were vocal uh, people who, um, took the view that we shouldn't have locked down in the first place and we shouldn't be considering that again. Um, so, yeah. You attended the meeting together with Professors Gupta and Hennigan. We'll hear from Professor Hennigan next, uh, as well as a, a Swedish expert epidemiologist, Dr. Anders Tegnell, yeah. um, and also Dame Angela McLean, who was then or was to become the deputy chief medical officer? No, she was then the chief scientist at the Ministry of Defence. Thank you. She was also co-chair of SPY-MO. And at the meeting, which was attended by the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, as, as well as other officials, the, the debate of whether or not to essentially put into place a package of relatively strict non-pharmaceutical interventions as opposed to allowing 
the virus to re-emerge and to re-wash through the population whilst segmenting or hermetically sealing off parts of it to the extent that that might have been possible was, was had in front of the Prime Minister. And during the course of that debate, um, I think you and Dame Angela McLean WhatsApped each other. Could we have, please, 207199? We are only concerned with the WhatsApps at the top of the page dated the 20th of September, because that's the date of the meeting, of course, and they commence around about 5.30, and the meeting was in the afternoon. So, Professor, these are plainly WhatsApps sent during the course of the meeting. Dame Angela McLean refers to, are we going to bring up the Seattle fishing vessel? Was that a reference to um, data gleaned from a fishing boat where a number of seamen had been shown to have antibodies have and were protected were well protected earlier reinfected uh, earlier infected um angela mclean who is this fuckwit john edmonds every statistic is wrong angela mclean patrick and chris will discount him later were those all references to the proponents of the contrary side of the debate I'm pretty but sure it's your next witness. Professor Hennon. All right. And during the, the course of the, the, this WhatsApp stream, we can also see a reference to Dr. Death, the Chancellor, and Dame Angela McLean saying, in ONS, you'd see it. Did you understand that those were references to the Eat Out to Help Out campaign, of which you've spoken about in... Moderately. Honestly, it's so long ago, I don't know. All right. But it could well be. Um, after the meeting, I think Professors Hennigan and Gupta tried to re-engage battle and, and, and to write to say that they'd not had a fair hearing and, and there was further information. Well, they. I mean, I had interrupted Mr. Uh, Professor Hennigan at one point because... Um, he was making some really basic epidemiological errors, the sorts of ones that we teach our students on day one. And um, I couldn't let it go after a while. And so I did interrupt. And so I, and that slightly put the wind out of his sails. And um, so, yes, and, I, and he hadn't interrupted me. So, I, you know, it's fair enough that they complained. I think you described um, his arguments as half-baked in that email string. But in any event, your argument, your views, did not, to use your own words, find favour with the Prime Minister. No, uh, I didn't manage to persuade them. And as we all know, that there was a, a, a rule of six, a rule of group of six put into place. Was that something that was discussed with Sage, do you recall? There was a tier structure put into place in October. Um, was the tier structure something that Sage had positively recommended? No. Did the tier structure... We hadn't discussed it. I mean, I, you know, we just discussed it afterwards. We, we tried to work yes. out whether it would be effective, but it, it was new to us. The idea hadn't come from Sage? No. And the result of that tier structure was, wasn't it, it's been described as an epilogue, epidemiological levelling up. That was how I described it at the time, yeah. And the, the, the terrible reality was that the spring uncoiled, the second wave reemerged, and that there was a second lockdown. By the time of that second lockdown and the peak of the deaths at the end of December and January, the beginning of January 2021, was our surveillance better? Oh, we, uh, you know, our surveillance from uh, late May, June was absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I think it's difficult to, to say with any certainty, but if it wasn't the best in the world, it must have been one of the best in the world. It was, our, our situational awareness was fantastic. And we've heard evidence of the ONS. Exactly. Coronavirus infection survey, the REACT study. Yeah the multitude of surveys 
as well as by then a, a much more developed testing structure exactly. and a huge serological a, a platform on which all these tests could be ascertained and, and um, made. The SAGE had been warning since September. You've showed us the report and, and the paper that went into that meeting. What is your view as to whether or not that second wave was inevitable or the consequence of not having acted earlier? So you asked me earlier this morning about being, you know, why didn't we raise the alarm in February or whatever? And I, I, w I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen again. And of course, our surveillance, as you just ex described, was so much better. So we did know what was happening. I think, so we had all the information. We knew how to do it. Um, you know, that was what that, that report on the 21st was all about. Um, so we could have avoided the, much of the autumn wave. We wouldn't have avoided everything, but we could have reduced the incidents. And if we'd have then put the longer term measures in place, we could have kept it low. You know, uh, over the autumn, cases would have happened. Some people would, unfortunately, have been hospitalized and died. It would have happened. But as it was, we let it go. And, uh, uh, you know, and so when we did eventually, as I'd explained on the 20th with the Prime Minister, I said the decision isn't to lock down or not. The decision is either you do it now and get on top of this epidemic and control the epidemic, or you let it control you. And it will force you into a lockdown at a later date when you'll have to lock down harder and longer, and many people will die as a consequence. And unfortunately, that is what happened. Um, over that autumn, from around 20 to 25,000 people died. And there is, uh, they, some would have done, but there's no reason for that number of people to have died at all. And then we, then we entered the, the winter phase with our hospitals full, uh, NHS staff having been under stress for months, as, oppo as opposed to having, it could have, you know, we, they could have been doing routine stuff that autumn and clearing the backlog from the, and that was not the case. Uh, and then we got hit by, by, the, by the, the, the alpha wave. And so on top of all of this pressure, we then had this new virus that was, you know, it took a little while, a couple of weeks to work out, but it, it was significantly more transmissible. Even worse, though we didn't know this until January, it was also more pathogenic. Uh, so we were, we couldn't have been worse prepared, really. Why did the lockdown from the beginning of November to the beginning of December not bring the levels of incidence, the overall rate, down enough to stop the re-emergence of the greatest part of that second wave, in fact, the peak in January? So it wasn't as stringent as the original lockdown. The key reason that the schools were open, and I think everybody wanted the schools to be open, um, uh, but there were other things. So it, it, there had been slight uh, adjustments in uh, who would be key workers and things like that. Was it long enough? Well, if it had been done earlier on, if it had been done uh, you know, in September it would have been plenty long enough. Or we could have done it around half term. So you'd have had the combination of the schools being closed. As it was, it happened just after half term. It was really made no... It, again, it showed there was no real strategy, no long term thinking. You know, uh, instead of just bouncing into, uh, you know, a panic decision as opposed to taking a, a strategic view of it and getting a grip of the epidemic and doing what was necessary when it was necessary. Is that why, on account of all, all the things that you say were not done that should have been done, and because the consequence is so terrible that you describe in your statement that that second wave was, the, for you, the worst moment of the epidemic? I said it publicly at the time. I really 
did think it was truly awful, and of course it did. Think it was another sixty-five thousand people died over the next few months. Alpha, yeah, was more transmissible, and to a slightly lesser extent, more severe, more pathogenic. It was very, very transmissible. Yeah. To what extent did the emergence of alpha at the end of November and the beginning of December? contribute to that terrible level of death? Uh, to a great extent, but of course we were starting from such a terrible starting point. Uh, you know, we were with our hospitals full and, and resources stretched and, and so on, so it was easy to miss it initially because cases were so high that how would you pick up? Uh, it was easy to miss an increase. If, if cases had been low, you would have seen an increase. Uh, much more quickly. Uh, so it was, it was, we were in such a terrible state when that happened. That was, it, it, you know, it may well have happened, you know, the alpha wave may well have happened anyway. There's no way of being able to tell that. Of course, actually, by letting the incidence increase, it, it made it more likely that we would have, you know, that the virus would be able to mutate. But that, I think it probably would, I think we would have probably dealt uh, it, it, but it might have happened. If we'd have been in a lockdown, we might have stopped it at source when it first emerged. Who knows? I, I don't think you could say that the, that that wave was a consequence of what happened in the autumn. It might have contributed. But we would have been in a much better place to deal with it. The government acted, in your words, relatively quickly, however, in December, yeah. realising the consequences of alpha. A great deal of work was done in ascertaining its transmissibility, its pathogenicity, the severity of the, the disease. And, and the government rapidly realized that Alpha had changed the dynamic, and therefore there was the third lockdown imposed. So it still was a little bit, yes, they did act quick. I, you know, they did act quickly. It was a, so the, there was a tier four that then uh, arose in, and was imposed in the Southeast and London, um, but there was still a little bit of a sort of shambolic. I remember the schools opened for one day in January and then they were closed. You know, again, hadn't really thought it through as a, as a government, I don't think, you know, across the, across the different sectors of government properly. Um, so, but yes, they, they acted relatively quickly. After the final national restrictions were eased in July, of 2021, the, the following summer, um, you describe how the epidemic settled at a relatively high level. By that, do you mean that the level of incidence again, the, the general level of infection through the population, plateaued, yeah. but by comparison to other countries, and perhaps in particular our Western European friends, at a relatively high level? Yeah, it was higher. Why was that? We didn't have any measures in place. They did. Um, so they had, the, so I, I say they, of course, it varied from country to country. But as a general, as a sort of generalization, I, most countries had some measures in place. Mask wearing was still, was still required. Many countries had kind of a vaccine passport. <coughs> so you couldn't get into a bar, for instance, unless you'd been vaccinated, which probably didn't make much difference to transmission but made people get vaccinated. So they actually had, so particularly in their younger population, they had, you know, I say I'm grouping, of course, all of Europe or something here, but, but many of our Western European neighbors had ha higher levels of vaccine coverage in younger, in younger individuals than we did. They'd also started vaccinating children much earlier than we did. So I remember at the beginning of uh, term September of 2021, uh, at that time, France, about 80% of, I may have these numbers slightly wrong, but roughly speaking, about 80% of their kids at um, secondary school age children had had one dose, and about 50% had two doses. We hadn't even started vaccinating our, uh, our, our children. It's important to note, isn't it, though, that in terms of, and, and this is for a later module, but in terms of that the United Kingdom's vaccination program, its development of vaccines, getting them out there, getting people vaccinated in, in a general sense, that that was a, a very considerable success. It was, um, and, we, and I think we started absolutely fantastically. We were fast, 
there were some very brave decisions made about the timing of one and two doses and things early in uh, January of 2021 around then, which were vindicated for sure. Yeah. I'm not sure we finished quite so well. We were a bit slow to finish the job. And then, of course, the, um, the further variant, the, the Delta wave, um, arrived, and, and there were very significant further deaths, were there not, between May 21 and, and December? There were, 21. despite all the vaccination, and we rolled out then a, a booster dose in the autumn of 2021, and so on. So, but still, I think it's about 15,000 people died in that, in that long, drawn-out, um, I don't know whether you call it a wave, because it was just a long, drawn-out period of high, of high incidence. That was going to be my next question. What link, if any, is there between the continuing high, relatively high level of incidence and the, the number of deaths that ensued? Oh, well, there's a you know, clear link. If you, the higher the incidence, then the, the greater the risk, of course, of someone being vulnerable, being acquiring infection. And so, yeah. And by the time that the Omicron wave um, arrived in, in the winter of 2021, of course, there was a very extensive vaccination program in place. Booster programs had been initiated for higher risk groups. And as it turned out, the Omicron variant was not as, you know, it, it was no worse, it was no more severe or pathogenic than its predecessors. It was far more transmissible, uh, and it was able to e evade the immune response. So even though we had high levels of uh, immunity in the population, mainly through vaccination, it could still spread amongst immunized individuals. Um, so it was, and we didn't know that it was less pathogenic. There were anecdotal reports, but I'm not sure you can really make government policy on kind of one or two anecdotes. And uh, so it, it took a while to work out some really nice work by Imperial College and others, uh, PHE and others, uh, to look to, to try and work out the risk. And the risk was lower, and thank heaven it was. I want to conclude just by putting you to some, some general questions and, and propositions from <clears throat> the core participants or some of the core participant groups in this inquiry, um, which I have not uh, so far addressed. Um, the long COVID groups ask whether or whether the 14th of April 2020 post-lockdown epidemiological scenarios paper didn't refer to long-term sequelae, if you can recall. Oh, I really don't remember. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, we all knew, of course, by then this was becoming a... It, it took a while, of course, to, to, to realise anything about long COVID. You have to have people to have COVID and then not recover. So uh, it takes a little while for, for, for this to be sort of um, realised, but by then it was starting to become clear. When this debate about mitigation and suppression and levelling the peak or squashing the sombrero was being yeah. had... Yeah. To, to what extent were long-term health conditions considered? They were actually considered. That was something that I remember that uh, Chris Whitty was very, very, very keen for us to keep forefront in our mind, that some of these measures uh, would have significant effects on people's lives, livelihoods, and therefore health uh, later on down the, down the track. Uh, so Chris was, sorry, Professor Whitty was, very uh, was very keen for us to make, never forget that and make sure that we uh, try to take it into consideration. And they did set up a, a couple of studies that, um, to try and look into it early on. Um, COVID bereaved family, Sir Justice Cymru asked, did you receive any data from the devolved administrations which was used in your modelling? Yes. FEMO asked, do demographic data sources and early statistical modelling typically include ethnicity? Uh, if you're looking at the risk, so the risk if you, um, of, of severe outcomes if you're infected, 
uh, then yes, that's routinely that's routinely looked at. Uh, we we didn't look at it in terms of the risk of you actually becoming infected. So it wasn't in our mathematical models. We didn't distinguish people's ethnicity in in, um, in our transmission dynamic models. But we now know, of course, that there were varying degrees of severity of impact depending on ethnicity. In in future, would you agree that that is an issue? which needs to be better modelled. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Professor. And lady, those are all my questions. Could I just ask one question, um, Professor Edmonds? You've mentioned an awful lot of work, of which I know the public would be extremely grateful that you and your colleagues were doing. I'm seeing the time for some of the emails. Um, not sure when you lot were sleeping, but um, <laughs> there were a lot of groups, committees and subgroups was that the right structure? Did they work? In other words, to the, just looking out as a layperson, it, it looks like an awful lot. It looks but terrible, doesn't it? But actually, they did work quite well, uh, very well. And, and it was some of the key ones, it, that was planned. That, that had been planned long before, so that SPY-M would feed into SAGE, that Nerve Tag would feed into SAGE, because before that, they, they were standing committees and they would feed in somewhere in the Department of Health. Um, but in an emergency, they would feed into SAGE, and they, they did. Uh, and... Um, and the way of working, particularly of SPY-M, was planned long in advance that, that we would always try and have, or SPY-M would always try and have multiple groups looking at the same question independently so that uh, to give some sort of validation. You know, models, you know, they're coming, I'm sure they're going to get heavily criticised in the next session. And they are, you know, they, they, they are very... Um, Uncertain, you know, projecting forward, it is uncertain. And so uh, the idea was always to have these multiple groups looking. And that had been planned a long, long time ago, and it worked, clicked into gear very well. And the expansion of SPYM worked, to SPYMO worked extremely well. It was brilliantly led by, um, by Graham Medley. And the other groups, it made sense. You were talking about ethnicity just now. That wasn't obvious before the pandemic that there would be uh, a greater uh, risk in ethnic. Maybe we should have thought it through more carefully, but that wasn't obvious to certainly to me at least. And so, an ethnic group, well, uh, ethnic group, uh, an ethnicity group was set up, and uh, and I think that was very important that it was to get to the bottom of why uh, why there was a higher risk. So. And, and other things like that happened. Uh, I think you had Kath Noakes this morning. She, they played a fantastic role in terms of understanding the, the physics of transmission. Um, we were sort of the population dynamics, and they were looking at the kind of, you know, does, how does, does ventilation work? And that became, you know, that suddenly that, you know, it, in sort of April, whenever it was, it became obvious that we needed something like that. So, yes, it looked, at the end, it looked like there was this enormous spaghetti. Um, but actually, no, there were, there was a sensible reason for all of those groups. They fed into SAGE, and okay, that meant perhaps SAGE did get rather big. Um, but it, it worked incredibly well, actually, at being able to uh, uh, assimilate all of that information. Uh, I mean, you asked me before about the role of the secretariat. I mean, I'm still astounded that they managed to keep all of that together. And, and yes, we can criticize the SAGE minutes. They are a bit terse and um, they are, you know, but, but all together, the, 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 the role that the civil service did uh, to support that enormous effort. So there was huge uh, scientific uh, efforts going on, but, you know, to bring it together, to make it available to government it was a huge effort by the civil service, um, and and it worked. So the, our government really was, perhaps not at the beginning, not up to March, but after that, it really was incredibly well uh, informed. Thank you very much indeed. If I may say so, Professor, I think you were unduly harsh on yourself this morning. You had a job, and you described it yourself. Your job was to provide expert advice to the policy and decision makers and if the system's working properly that advice is relayed to them then they consider the advice coming from other quarters about economics and social consequences and the like um i'm not sure you could have done more than you did consistent with your role at the time but you obviously did as much as you felt was appropriate so i'm really grateful to you i'm sure we all are. thank you
Thanks. And I'm afraid you're not the first and you won't be the last scientist whose work is misunderstood. It probably goes to the territory, yeah. I fear. Thank you very much. Thank Shall you. we break now before? Indeed. Thank right. you, Lady. I shall return at 20 past. All right.
My lady, our final witness for today is Professor Carl Hennigan. Okay. I do so much. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly declare, and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall, give shall be the truth, shall the, whole, be, sorry. the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Can you uh, please give us your full name? Carl James Hennigan. Thank you. Uh, Professor, you have prepared at our request a statement for the inquiry, which is being brought up on the screen. Uh, and I, I know that you're familiar with the contents of that statement. Um, we can see, I don't ask um, for this to be brought up on screen, but on the final page of your statement, uh, you've signed the statement um, below a statement, a, an assertion that you believe the facts stated within it are true. Uh, and that signature was dated the 24th of September of this year. Is that right? Correct. Thank you. Uh, you are uh, a professor of evidence-based medicine at Oxford University. Um, could you um, please uh, explain what that uh, discipline entails? Yeah, so evidence-based medicine is the integration of the best available evidence with clinical experience and expertise with patient values about making decisions about health care for individual patients or systems. It largely grew out of about the 1980s when there was a growing recognition that there were severe, severe harms being caused in healthcare. Just, Professor, I'm just going to inter interrupt mm. you. Um, if I could ask you to try and keep okay. your voice slow, I appreciate it's, okay. it's, it's not an easy thing to do, uh, but it would, it would make um, everyone's life a, a little easier if you could. In the 1980s, a realisation that the use of poor quality evidence or opinion was harming patients in quite significant numbers and leading to excess mortality. Over time, what's happened is there's been a change to the use of best available evidence. And a very good example of that, what you saw yesterday in the recovery trial, you would expect to see randomised controlled trials for the use of interventions in healthcare around drugs and vaccines. That's the same as well for non-pharmaceutical interventions. We particularly sit at the top of the tree doing systematic reviews, which tries to say, look at all the ev available evidence, diagnostics, prognostics and treatment effects. Thank you. So that's a, a taste, at any rate, of, of that field um, in which, as we've said, you, you are a professor at Oxford mm -hmm. University. Um, it's also right, is it not, that you are a, a member of the Royal College of General Practitioners and, in fact, still a, a practising GP alongside your academic work? Yes, yeah, so I qualified as a doctor in 2000 and received MRC GP status in 2005 and I work as an NHS urgent care GP who basically works right at the front line and my speciality is doing visits and I continue to do that right throughout the pandemic. Uh, Professor, in the time we have this afternoon, um, I want to ask you uh, about uh, events that took place during the autumn of 2020, uh, in particular uh, a time, as we know, when calls uh, were made uh, to alter the approach to the pandemic. Um, there was a public debate, was there not? On the one hand, uh, we heard calls for uh, a circuit breaker lockdown and an increase uh, in the restrictions that were in play. And on the other hand, uh, there was argument about reducing the uh, restrictions. Uh, and as we'll come to see, uh, the Great Barrington Declaration. Mm -hmm. and, and as part of that debate, as in fact we've already heard, uh, you and others met the Prime Minister in September 2020, and that's another area um, that I will wish to ask you some questions about. But before we get into the detail of those events, uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about your expertise in this area, um, as, as it stood at 2020, the outset of the pandemic. Uh, as you know, because I think you've been following the inquiry, um, we have heard this week from a series uh, of academics who have spent, uh, in, in the main, their professional careers, researching, analysing the spread of infectious diseases, uh, developing models to analyse how such diseases spread and how they can be controlled, and considering large-scale public health issues, 
relating to pandemic preparedness and so on. Uh, you don't have a, a comparable type of expertise in this area, do you? So if you mean, do I have a narrow expertise in a single specific disease, the answer is no. Well, it, that wasn't quite my question. Oh, okay. uh, that may be right, uh, but it's also the case, isn't it, that you have not studied over the course of your academic career um, preparedness for pandemics, infection uh, control, uh, the way in which uh, viral uh, diseases spread through populations and so on. Yeah, so let me elaborate on where my expertise lies. You know, it relies in the evidence base in the community. And increasingly, what we see now is a realization that most of what we're seeing requires a generalist approach, because there's two areas broadly which you can consider is non-communicable diseases, things like cancer, heart disease, and then you've got communicable diseases, acute respiratory infections. And what's particularly important is how they interact in the community and you develop an evidence base. And as we sit here, about 27% of the English population has multimorbidity. That's two or more chronic conditions. By the time that goes to 65, that becomes in over 50% of the population. Now, you'll have started to realize in the inquiry, and we've learned the relationship between multimorbidity and the impact of communicable diseases is interesting and important because of its elevated risk and the exacerbations and the severity of disease that's caused by that interaction. My expertise is in how we develop the evidence on diagnostics, prognostics, and treatments to look at those areas. All right. And so, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Professor. I'd like just to call up a, a, a document because I just, before we get into the detail mm. of 2020, I'd like to just have a look at the, the types of matters that you mm. were researching um, in that period, or, or rather the, the year or so before 2020. Mm. Could we call up on screen, please, INQ 314600? Whilst that document's coming up, Professor, if you, if, can I repeat the message? It's really important that, that we get your evidence down in full. And okay. um, although I'm not taking every other, I'm struggling, and so I suspect our sonographer is too. I speak too quickly as well, so I, I understand the problem. Though, if you could just slow down a bit. Mm -hmm. Professor, uh, as you know, um, because you've, you've, you've seen this document today, it's actually just an extract from your website. Yeah. Um, and on your website, you list the peer review publications mm -hmm. that, that you have published mm -hmm. down the years. Uh, and these are the publications from mm -hmm. 2019, 2018, 2017, and so on. In other words, the years running up to the pandemic. Mm. Um, and if we can look briefly, um, one can see, uh, for example, uh, on this first page, in the, the last few months of 2019, papers that you uh, published included papers about urinary tract infections, uh, shoulder pain, a uh, couple of papers about bacterial infections in older people. If we can go over to the next page, please. Uh, uh, there are papers there, are there not, about heart attacks, mm -hmm. uh, strokes. Um, there's, a, there's a paper towards the bottom about sodium valproate, which I think is a drug used to treat epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep. Um, if we go over to the next page, uh, childhood cancer in Egypt, cardiovascular risk. About halfway down the page, there's a paper on hypertension. And it, looking at these papers, you seem to have had a particular interest in high blood pressure. Is that right? I need to answer the question in full. So, right. Well, I'll let me just look at one or two others, and then we that, then you can can respond. If we look over at page four, uh, there are papers about people who suffered strokes, uh, the effects of statins in the elderly. Uh, towards the bottom of the page, vitamin D, whether or not it prevents fractures and falls. Mm -hmm. And then finally, this takes us to the end of that year of 2019 on page five. Uh, for example, another paper about hypertension, uh, something about sleep-wake disturbance and ocular disease. Uh, and at the top of the page there, a, a paper about uh, the human papillomavirus, I think I pronounced it correctly, uh, which I think is, is, is something that create, can cause uh, warts and, mm. and in some cases cancer. So, um, Professor, the, the, the general picture 
uh, I would suggest at least looking at your published papers uh, prior to the pandemic, is that you had a, a, a sort of general interest in matters relating to primary care, uh, perhaps running in parallel with your practice as a general practitioner. Uh, but let me put the question, but not that uh, detailed um, interest in uh, viral transmission of, of diseases that we've seen with the other experts. So, number one, in 2019, you're referring to my role as Editor-in-Chief of BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine, so you've re referred to a number of editorials, which I will have wrote. Second is you're referring to, I'm also Director of Programs in Evidence-Based Healthcare, which is a global program that supports DPhil students and masters. So when we're talking about cancer in Egypt, that's I'm supervising a DPhil student at that moment in time is publishing in that arena. But if you go across the breadth of what I want, you didn't go back to 2014 where you start and go, well, with the Tamiflu reviews in the last pandemic where we spent four and a half years doing that evidence. The second aspect is within the respiratory team is it's a team effort. So when I am in a position where we're looking at something and there's something, for instance, not quite there in a disease specialist, we will pull that to us. As an example, when we were asked by the World Health Organization in 2020 to do the systematic reviews on transmission, of which we published 17 papers, there's a microbiologist, a virologist, immunologist, medical statistician, and there's also an expert in the clinical epidemiology of respiratory viruses. So we bring, I bring together a team. But yes, it's fair to say I have a view, particularly diagnostics, particularly harms, and I'd say more so in the elderly, I have an interest in the interaction between communicable and non-communicable diseases. And so, for instance, some of those diseases we see, like diabetes, has a huge impact when you look at acute respiratory infections in the community. Yeah. It's also important to realize what does community respiratory transmission look like when you understand there are 30 different pathogens that can cause viral immunity, pneumonia in the community in the UK. That broad understanding allows me to then use the evidence-based approach to come and say what's the best available evidence we should be using for a decision or action. So, um, Professor, I think really we're not disagreeing over very much mm. at all. You describe a broad approach, mm -hmm. which is different from the very specialist uh, experience uh, and practice mm -hmm. of some of the other experts we've heard. And just, just finally on this, many of the experts um, of the academics who've given evidence this week have sat on either SPY-MO or SAGE or NERVTAG, uh, and I think it's right to say that you, you have not sat on those committees. No, I have not. Thank you. Let me move, um, Professor, then to, as I said, uh, the debate in autumn 2020 about uh, appropriate uh, COVID uh, guidance or, or, or regulation. Uh, and by way of context, as I've said, uh, we saw that uh, cases in that period were rising. Uh, there had been a call for circuit breaker lockdowns, uh, others arguing that so-called whole population measures were inappropriate. Uh, and amongst those making that latter argument uh, were Professor Sunetra Gupta, uh, also of Oxford University, uh, and also yourself. Mm -hmm. And we've heard that on the 20th of September, which was a Sunday, uh, there was a meeting uh, with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor which you and Professor Gupta attended. I say attended, it was, of course, a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the day after, the 21st of September, uh, we just heard from Professor Edmonds that there was a SAGE meeting, but it's also right, isn't it, uh, that you and Professor Gupta and others published an, a, an open letter on that day uh, relating to COVID regulations, and we may look at that in a moment. Uh, and then the third date I wanted to mention was a couple of weeks later, on the 4th of October, when the Great Barrington Declaration was published. And I'd like to start, if I may, uh, with that document, the Great Barrington Declaration. Mm -hmm. um, it's helpfully been brought up on screen. It's a relatively short document, and we can take it page by page. We see the uh, at the top 
after the title, um, there is a, a summary which states that as infectious disease epidemiologists and public health scientists, we have grave concerns about the damaging physical and mental health impacts of the prevailing COVID policies and recommend an approach we call focused protection. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come to ask you about that focused protection policy. Um, while we're looking at this page, um, one notes that at the end of the document, there is a reasonably lengthy list of signatures, um, which doesn't include your own. Mm -hmm. But there is a reference here to 937,000 signatures. Mm -hmm. uh, are you one of the 937,000? No. Um, you didn't sign the, de the declaration? No. Well, if we may, we will simply note the contents of the declaration. They'll come and ask you why you didn't sign mm -hmm. um, So if we can go over the page. Uh, the first substantive paragraph really just repeats the summary we've already noted. There is then a paragraph which refers to the, as it said, devastating effects on short and long-term public health of current lockdown policies. Examples are given uh, lower childhood vaccination rates, fewer cancer screenings, and so on. Over the page, please. Uh, there's a reference to the fact that the understanding of the virus is growing. Uh, and in particular, it is said we know that vulnerability to death is more than a thousandfold higher in the old and infirm than the young. Indeed, for children, COVID is less dangerous than many other harms, including influenza. Uh, and then, perhaps really the core of the uh, declaration, it, it, it's asserted that as immunity builds in the population, the risk of infection uh, to all, including the vulnerable, falls. We know that all populations will eventually reach herd immunity, which is the point at which the rate of new infections is stable, and that this can be assisted by, but is not dependent on, a vaccine. Our goal should therefore be to minimise mortality and social harm until we reach herd immunity. Uh, and reading on, it said the most compassionate approach that balances the risks and benefits of reaching herd immunity is to allow those who are at minimal risk of death, by inference the young who have been referred to, um, to live their lives normally to build up immunity to the virus through natural infection, while better protecting those who are at highest risk. And that is, that paragraph is a, is a description of this is said of this policy, policy rather, of focused protection. Uh, and then next paragraph emphasizes the need to adopt measures to protect the vulnerable. That's one half of the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the paragraph afterwards uh, stresses the other half of the equation, which is those who are not vulnerable should immediately be allowed to resume life as normal. Uh, simple hygiene measures are referred to, uh, but then the theme is schools and universities should be open, restaurants and other businesses should open, arts, music, sport, and so on should resume. And finally, people who are at more risk may participate if they wish, while society as a whole enjoys the protection conferred upon the vulnerable by those who have built up herd immunity. So that's the declaration. Um, why was it, as you've told us, Professor, that you did not sign this declaration? So you referred to the meeting of the 20th of September. Yes. Um, can I elaborate on that meeting, or are you going to come well, back? Well, I, I, I'm certainly coming back to it. Okay. So I wanted to just use this declaration, this document, as a way of identifying what that, that policy was before we go back to the meeting. That meeting, when I was announced, was the first time I met Professor Sinetra Gupta, who's a theoretical epidemiologist. Subsequent to that, as you talked about disease expert, he's, he's a disease expert in the area of interest and I spoke to a weekly. We are broadly in agreement about many areas. But one of the issues that happened after that meeting was it was subsequently leaked to the press. And then I was under pressure from articles calling me an agent of disinformation, uh, abuse on social media, and felt under pressure. Um, I communicated with uh, Professor Kullendorf and uh, Martin Kullendorf and Jay Bhattacharya and Sinatra Gupta was asked to sign it. And at the time, I was, we was also working on a series of systematic reviews 
that we felt we were trying to interpret and understand. I agree with the broad aims of the Barrington Declaration, but I would not let my emotions and opinions run into something when I didn't have time, because there are one or two areas might, where you might look at it and go, I think actually it needs more detail, and you know, particularly if you said everybody should return to work as normal, you know, that's the sort of thing where given the gravity of what was happening, from an evidence-based perspective, I would have derailed it and said, I need to step back and really consider that issue. It would have took me quite a few weeks with my team to get to an opinion on that. In doing so, like I said, I agree with the broad themes, but by the time it had been published and was out there, I think the position was clear and there was no weight to be added by me signing it. And as I said, I was under considerable pressure in all sorts of different ways and still trying to inform the debate in the background, as you'll see later, with an evidence-based approach. All right. So was, um, I think you've made the position very clear, Professor, which is that you, you did agree with the, the broad mm -hmm. terms of the declaration, and you've explained the, uh, the sort of pragmatic reasons mm. why you didn't sign it. Um, the evidence that the inquiry has received uh, is that there are at least three uh, quite sort of high-level principled objections to the focus protection policy. Uh, and what I want to do is go through them with you one by mm. one. And of course, uh, if, if, if they sort of overlap with any of your concerns about the policy, you, you, you will be able to say so. And just to be clear, we, once we've done that, we'll go back and talk okay. about the, the meeting uh, in Downing Street. Um, what I'm going to do for these purposes is really look at uh, Professor Woolhouse's statement, because he uh, identified um, what he regarded as the real problems with the focus protection approach. Um, but I will also take you to uh, Chris Witt's statement, because he has said some similar things. So. Um, if we can go to paragraph 175 of Professor Woolhouse's statement, uh, he says, as I understand it, the Great Barrington Declaration advocated an approach where vulnerable individuals are protected, uh, but the virus is left to circulate until enough people have been infected uh, to reach the herd immunity threshold. I had three concerns about that approach at the time and declined to sign the declaration when invited to do so. And then we can see at paragraph 176, he identifies the first of those uh, difficulties or, or, or objections, uh, which is that the size of the resulting epidemic would be so large that the public health burden, just in the low-risk segment, by that he means the, the young people, uh, the low-risk segment of the population, would be enough to overwhelm the NHS, noting that low risk is not zero risk, and some of these individuals would develop severe disease. Um, wh what do you say to that? Which one, the first or both? Sorry. Well, I think he's making a single point. Oh, so what he's basically coming at is the aspect that what we've got to understand from respiratory infections is the first thing is to say between summer and winter, there is a large increase in unplanned respiratory emissions. We go from about 15,000 to about 30,000 every year. The vast majority of the deaths in respiratory infections occur in that winter phase. There is an element that you cannot reduce the risk to zero for anybody. Some of the respiratory pathogens will affect younger people much more so, influenza, RSV. The coronavirus was very much to the elderly population. I think the problem is, is if you say we're going to have no approach whatsoever, that was not the approach that was being uh, undertaken by Sweden that actually there were subtle uh, reductions in, in mobility in the population. So, for instance, they didn't have mass gatherings. They, didn't, they had reductions in people attending restaurants and public houses. You couldn't stand at a bar, for instance. So they didn't have no effect. So can I just interrupt you there? Is this one of those areas where you didn't agree with the Great Barrington Declaration? We've looked at it. Yeah. It's very clear that, really, beyond hand-washing, for that the younger segment of the population, they would live their lives as normal. Are you saying that you didn't agree with that? Well, I think that the idea of live life as normal in the face of an emerging risk is, 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 not, is not possible because everybody will attenuate their risk in some way. So, for instance, 
if you are a young person and you have a grandma who's 85, 90, you have to attenuate your behaviour because if you're going to take a, your illness, irrespective of whether it's coronavirus, it could be a common cold, it could be highly harmful for that elderly person. So I would expect younger people to change their behaviours in some ways to match the risk that is presented. Thank you. So are you agreeing with me that uh, you do not agree with the broad proposal in the Great Barrington Declaration that young people should live their lives as normal? And I think what's happening there well, is... The Professor, Barrington... could I ask you for a yes or no answer? Y yes, I am. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on um, to the second uh, of Professor Woolhouse's uh, propositions. Uh, he said, it wasn't made clear how well the vulnerable segment could be protected from infection in practice. Uh, here, of course, he's referring to the older segment of the population. It certainly couldn't be 100%, and that meant a further, also potentially very large, burden on the NHS. Now, Professor, before you answer, we're going to come to your mm. paper that you produced mm. for the Downing Street meeting, and we'll see in there a number of measures are encouraged to protect the, the, the vulnerable population. But the point that Professor Woolhouse is making is that it just isn't possible uh, to provide a sufficient level of, of uh, protection uh, to protect them when the rest of society is, is not taking those measures. And it may be that that rather chimes with the point you just made about young people visiting their grandparents. So when you decide to lock down, one of the key issues is what happens is you equalise the risk across all the age groups. And in doing so, the theory says, and actually the practice is, you actually can increase the risk of those in the most vulnerable category. As an example of that, in the first wave, care homes, 45% of care homes had outbreaks, and in some parts of the north it was 55%. What the argument about the younger population, those least at risk, which is what happens now, is that as they go about their daily life, they will build up a wall of immunity and reduce the susceptible population. And in doing so, that means the elderly actually gain an advantage. But if you're telling me you lock down and the elderly are at less risk, that didn't happen as you saw in the first wave and in the second wave, that actually there is not a clear relationship between reducing the risk in the young people and your ability to suppress the virus in areas like care homes. Professor, I'm going to interrupt you. I think we might be at slightly cross-purposes. Okay. You're, um, you, you're now talking about whether lockdowns mm -hmm. of the whole population mm -hmm. are effective, mm -hmm. but I'm asking you uh, about whether this policy of focused protection uh, is effective. Uh, and the criticism that was made by Professor Woolhouse and, amongst others, uh, by Chris Whitty is that this idea of, I mean, we, we've heard various descriptions, cocooning, segmenting, shielding, uh, that vulnerable section of society, it, it may be a very attractive idea in principle, uh, but to use um, Chris Whitty's uh, phrase, it's entirely impracticable. It simply won't work. Well, that's, I think that's an opinion, and it comes from people with opinions. It's not, it, it's not rooted in evidence. So, for instance, in care homes, there is evidence, for instance, in the US, what they call greenhouse homes, smaller homes, less mortality. More clinical care reduces more mortality. More nurses reduces mortality. So there are many areas you could sit in a room, but you, what you can't do is come off the top of the head with uh, how you would look at this and, and propose this. But there is evidence to suggest how you might go about this. It is not an evidence-free zone, as these people suggest. However, if you want to integrate and understand how you might go about it, I would argue that's where you need a generalist who can talk to you about what's happening in the community and how you might go about that. Can I just oh, interrupt you, you then for a second? Again, can I ask for a yes or no answer? Do you agree uh, with the objection that Professor Woolhouse is making uh, to the Great Barrington approach? Uh, yes or no? No. I'm going to move on to the last of his objections, um, which goes to this question of herd immunity, which, as we saw, is really the sort of the bedrock of the Great Barrington Declaration. 
isn't it? Because the whole approach assumes uh, that the younger segment of the population will acquire herd immunity through infection. Uh, and you have just referred to uh, what you describe as the advantage of that because it provides mm -hmm. protection to the older mm. population as well. Uh, and the point that uh, Professor Woolhouse makes here is that there was an assumption in the Great Barrington Declaration that there would be what he describes as solid post-infection immunity uh, and that therefore herd immunity threshold could be reached in a matter of months. He says, and I think it's clear he's talking about back in 2020, he was concerned that this might not be the reality, in which case the threshold might not be reached for years or not at all, and therefore the strategy would fail. He goes on, and he's clearly now talking about his current state of knowledge, we now know that post-infection immunity does not give 100% protection, that individuals can be reinfected multiple times, maybe that some people in this room know what he's talking about, uh, and that the herd immunity threshold is almost certainly unattainable. He says this undermines a core premise of the Great Barrington approach. Is he right about that? Before answering, I need to be clear, where does it say solid post-defection immunity in the Great Barrington Declaration? Well, Professor, it must be right, mustn't it? We looked at the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, the premise there was that the younger population who were living their lives normally would catch COVID, would thereby gain uh, immunity, and that corporately, that segment of the population would attain herd immunity. If, if they're not going to attain immunity, having caught COVID, then uh, the policy just doesn't work, does it? So that's a misunderstanding of the Barrington Declaration and what the authors were proposing. Having spent two and a half years with Professor Gupta, I've never heard us make that statement. What happens in reality, there are a number of other circulating pathogens like rhinovirus, for which we know this. There are also other circulating coronaviruses like 229E and OC43, that when you get an infection, you will get an, an immune response that will be of variable nature and will last for a certain period of time, up to about 12 months, possibly 18 months. But as you second understood, these pathogens have uh, the ability to escape your immunity. That's where the variants come in. So if you look at rhinovirus, there are about 150 different variants that exist. So what happens is what you're describing is the position we find ourselves now with all of the other viruses that have been post-pandemic, there will come a position where a part of the population will have immunity and that will dampen it down from going to the 60-70% that was thought would happen in the models. That figure is roughly around 30% of the population. So as you transit into winter now, you are susceptible to a number of different viruses and you will recatch them. But some people are not susceptible and that's why we will still have waves of infection. We will have problems in the NHS. 17 of 20 years we've had a winter crisis, but a part of the population will be not susceptible and therefore we won't get these massive waves that are in the model. I see. So uh, uh, is what you're saying that um, the, Her the, the uh, Great Barrington Declaration never suggested that there would be, as it were, complete immunity uh, amongst that younger segment of the population. Is that in yes or no? I am saying yes, it never said that. All right. Um, uh, there's one more point I want to ask you about the Great Barrington Declaration, Professor, and, and that's a, a, an issue which isn't mentioned by Professor Woolhouse, although it's related to one of them. Mm. We've spoken about the risk... Um, that the younger segment of the population would themselves catch COVID and suffer a, acute symptoms from it. That was the first of Professor Woolhouse's objections. Um, but, but there's another point, which is that already by the autumn of 2020, when the Great Barrington uh, Declaration was published, um, it was um, becoming understood, it was already understood, uh, that um, a significant group of people who caught COVID um, would go on to suffer long-term sequelae from it, a post-viral syndrome, which of course we, we know as long COVID. Uh, that 
risk, which affects young people and old people alike, uh, was another reason, was it not, why the proposal in the Great Barrington Declaration was flawed? So all of the acute respiratory infections that circulate in the community have the potential to cause long sequelae. Now, your influenza increases your risk of uh, stroke, heart disease, bacterial pneumonia, meningitis, RSV, bronchiolitis, risk of hospital admission, and then there are others like glandular fever that can give a long immune response. The question you're asking me, which is what you need to ask, is to what extent does an infection with a coronavirus lead to increased complications and long-term outcomes compared to the other acute respiratory infections because they do have a significant impact on morbidity and mortality, particularly in those with comorbidities and multiple morbidities. So if you've got a pre-existing disease like heart failure, it will be worsened to the point where it can have a significant impact on your morbidity and mortality. If you let me I'm just going to interrupt you because I think we're diverting mm -hmm. from the... Uh, from the question a little bit, Professor. Uh, 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 we have heard expert evidence uh, about post-viral syndromes. We know they exist. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to focus very sharply on long COVID, please. Yes. Um, and just coming back to my question, it wasn't uh, the existence of long COVID where significant numbers of people suffer very serious long-term uh, sequelae, including people in the younger population. Wasn't that another reason uh, why the policy of letting that group of people, as it was said, live their lives normally was flawed? It can be used as an argument, but I think if you're going to take an evidence-based approach, you really have to define what you're on about and quantify what you're on about, and then I can truly answer the question. But it is an argument that people would put forward for wrong reason, for, for having alternative views to try and suppress the virus. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm Professor, I'm not following. Why isn't, and I understand an evidence-based approach, it's my approach yeah. has been as a judge throughout my, um, as a lawyer throughout my working life. Why isn't the fact that we now have evidence that you have post-viral long-term sequelae in long COVID, uh, is the example here being given, why isn't that evidence for your evidence-based approach? Because when you compare that, as the evidence has just emerged in the last month, if you compare that to other acute respiratory infections, what you're interested in is to what extent you get more of something with the coronavirus. So, for instance, the evidence shows things like taste and smell is worse with the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 infection. But your risk on heart attack or stroke might not be as severe. It could turn out there are specific respiratory complications in people with like asthma and chronic airway disease. But it's incredibly important you say, what's the risk compared to the baseline, which is other acute respiratory pathogens, and not compare it to the normal population? I am not saying that the infection leads to no risk. It is quite clear it has severe complications. The question is, how much is that more severe than the other acute respiratory infections for which you don't have the same restrictive policies, but they do have a severe consequence in the population? I understand the comparison is important, mm. or the comparative analysis is mm. important. What I'm just questioning is... The fact that Mr O'Connor was putting to you was that we know post-viral syndromes exist and therefore I was just putting why isn't that evidence? It may be that there's more evidence that needs yeah, to be okay. put into the balance but it just seemed to me that it was evident. Well, yeah, so everything exists as evidence, even my opinion exists as evidence within mm, the not frame. Not in my world, well, it does okay, not but a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're not in a court of law, it doesn't. But, um, but the, the, what you, you need to do is quantify the size of the effect of the difference, and that's really important, because then that helps you understand where you need to intervene if you've had a post-viral COVID infection. That's incredibly important. What do you treat? And it's particularly important in two groups of people, those with pre-existing conditions who've, who've worsened, but also there are some people who will come with no pre-existing conditions and then will have complications. For instance, maybe they have respiratory complications. That then helps you understand how to intervene. Let me just ask you one more question about that and perhaps you can answer shortly. 
you just said that the risk of, in this case, a post-viral symptom needs to be quantified. Mm -hmm. The Great Barrington Declaration doesn't mention long COVID at all. No. Now, I know you didn't draft it, but do you know whether it was taken into account at all or not? I don't know the answer to that. All right. I'm going to move on, Professor, and finally just ask you a few questions about the meeting we've referred to once or twice and which we've heard about uh, from others. There's a Zoom meeting on a Sunday uh, in September 2020. The context, as we've heard, was a very public debate going on at the time about the, whether there should or shouldn't be some form of circuit breaker, uh, as it's been described. And it, it's clear from some of the documents that the inquiry has seen that the meeting, the Zoom meeting, as we've said, had a title, which was, should the government intervene now, and if so, how? Now, I'm not sure whether you ever were aware of that. It, some of the attendees, it looks as though when they were sent the invitation, they were told this is what the meeting's going to be about. Was that the case with you, or, or can you remember um, I, one way or the other? I can't remember one way or the other. All right. Apologies. It, it's, it's right, though, isn't it, um, that before the meeting, and I know I'm going to ask you about when, but before the meeting, you were asked to provide a short note for the purposes of it. Correct. Now, we know that the meeting took place on Sunday the 20th. When were you asked to provide the note? I was asked about uh, roughly in an email around about 7 p.m., 8 p.m. on the Friday. I can't quite remember the exact time. And uh, were you able or, or were you told when the note was needed by? 12 o'clock the next day. On the Saturday? On the Saturday. And were you able to meet that deadline? No. On the Saturday morning, I was working in urgent care, doing home visits, and I didn't finish till 1 p.m. So I sent them an email and said, can I have till 4 p.m. with the agreed timeline for me to submit the one-page submission. And did they give you that extension? Yes, they did. All right. So we're going to look at the, the note now, but we'll bear in mind, I think this is what you're telling us, Professor, that you, it was compiled in something of a rush? It was compiled in something of a rush, and it was compiled with my colleague, Professor Tom Jefferson, who also had input to the document. And we'll, we'll look at some of the detail in the, in the note in a moment, Professor, but can I ask you at the outset, and if you like, in summary, um, did you argue in writing in this note, and then when it came to it orally at the meeting, in favour of the type of policies that we've been looking at in the Great Barrington Declaration. I think in reading that, you'd, you'd say, yeah, broadly, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, if we do look, for example, about halfway down... Uh, excuse me a moment. Um, we see there um, aim to control the spread of acute respiratory illness while minimising social disrupt, societal disruption. Yeah. So, in summary, a similar approach. Uh, and we see, if we can, sorry, if we can zoom out again, um, we see uh, uh, the bullet points below. Uh, many of them are, as I mentioned, focused on that need to protect the vulnerable, and there are some practical yeah. policies that you were proposing as to how that should be done. I'd like to ask you, um, if I may, about a line towards the top of the paper. Um, sorry, we'll need to go back. Um, so at the very top, after the title, there's a, a bit in italics about uh, terminology. And then immediately underneath that, it says this. The current strategy requires acknowledging the virus is endemic uh, and the need to learn to live with COVID. Now, Professor, I, I want to ask you about your description of the virus as endemic at mm. that point. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, but... There's a distinction, isn't there, between a, a virus or a disease which is at a stage of being an epidemic, uh, where it spreads quickly, unexpectedly, and unpredictably. It becomes a pandemic if it acts in that way across a very large area, across nations. But that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, an endemic disease is one that is consistently present in a region or population, uh, and where its prevalence 
remained stable and it spread fairly predictable. Now, that's what I understand by those terms, but are you saying, or were you saying there, uh, that COVID in September 2020 uh, was a disease that was stable and predictable? No, because there's nothing predictable about acute, acute respiratory infections per se across the whole of my 20 years, apart from broad areas, for instance, a seasonal effect, which you can understand they're highly unpredictable agents. And therefore, the, the point being made is that where we were at, if, and I have to elaborate here if you don't mind, we'd gone from March, April to flatten the curve, two weeks to protect the NHS, to an area now where we were talking about zero COVID and suppression. The policy on the table was to reduce infections below 1,000 and then keep test and trace to keep it below that level. What had happened over the summer is, remember, we're scaling up testing and there was a misperception that actually out there was far less cases. The only cases were the ones that were being detected. Well, actually, there's pre-symptomatic phase, asymptomatic phases. There are also people who don't turn up for testing. My experience throughout the whole summer was telling me, right back to March the 15th, that there was much wider circulation than this virus is being understood if you're just looking at the case numbers. And that's one of the problems when you're just research-focused and data-focused. If you don't have an ability to triangulate and say what's happening on the ground, you will read inconsistencies and come to misperceptions in the data. Thank you, Professor. But I do just want to press you on this mm. uh, sentence here, which you put in the note, albeit drafted in a bit of a rush, mm. for the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. um, you are a scientist, uh, and you use that word endemic deliberately. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it does mean, doesn't it, a disease that is stable uh, and predictable? Well, not in all, it's not a clear definition that I would agree with. It, what it well, means I'm is... I'm going to interrupt you a minute. Let's just look, if we may, at a graph, mm -hmm. um, just to get uh, the context here. It's uh, INQ 00028-3367. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can see there's a date there of the 1st of October. Mm -hmm. So we see, if we look just to the left, obviously, that's the 20th mm -hmm. of September of that year. Mm -hmm. um, but there was nothing stable or predictable, as it turned out, about COVID um, at that date, was there, Professor? Well, in terms of the seasonal effect, there are predictable natures to January, the second week of January, about seven of the last ten years, you will see the, the, the highest number of deaths from acute respiratory infections. Most of that occurs in the over 80s. So within, if you notice my plan, is that actually there is a seasonal effect, but actually what's more so is unpredictable is the fact you've got the sharp rise in April, May. I'd say that's more unpredictable. There is a generalised predictability to the seasonal effect that starts in about the 1st of December and goes into January, February. I just want to press you, though, um, mm -hmm. Professor, because you used that word endemic, mm -hmm. didn't you, to suggest... It's no longer an epidemic. Uh, it's no longer unpredictable, growing exponentially. It's endemic. It's stable in the community. It's predictable. And if we look at that graph, you were wrong to use that word, weren't you? No. So you're using interchangeable terms all the time, which is difficult to follow. Epidemic... Just, sorry to interrupt you. Epidemic and endemic are not interchangeable terms, are they? But epidemic and pandemic are. I wasn't asking you about epidemic and pandemic. I was asking you about epidemic and endemic. So what, in terms of endemic, is there's widespread global circulation of the pathogen that's begun beyond low-level circulation. No acute respiratory infection is predictable or stable. So I would contest what you're looking at is not my interpretation of the word endemic, and I would have had the opportunity at the meeting to explain all of the nuances around those issues of what I meant. Within the problem of remember, throughout summer, 
you were scaling up the testing, we were scaling up the testing, so our actual understanding of what was going on was fairly limited until we scaled up the testing. I see. Uh, I'm going to move on, Professor. I, you referred to the meeting. I'd like to take you to something different, please, which is um, the Prime Minister's account of the meeting. Um, if we could go, please, to INQ 255836, uh, and it's page 130. The then Prime Minister's account. The then Prime Minister's account. I know you've had a chance to, to, to look at this in advance, Professor. Um, we see at paragraph 462, um, Mr Johnson referring to this meeting and the title, Should the Government Intervene Now? And if mm -hmm. so, how he runs through the attendees that we've heard something about. We see your name there, mm -hmm. um, as well as actually many others. Uh, he refers at paragraph 463 uh, to the views presented by Professor Edmonds, and Professor uh, Angela McLean, who he describes as representing the more conventional epidemiological view. Uh, and then he said that, that Professors Gupta and you were there to present two opposing views uh, and refers to Dr. Tegnell presenting the Swedish approach. Uh, he records about halfway down the paragraph Professor Edmonds's advice, which of course we've heard evidence about this afternoon. Uh, and Mr. Johnson, states at the bottom of this page, I greatly respected Professor Edmonds' views, but had always put him at the gloomier end of the spectrum. I wanted to give the rule of six a chance to work and to hear some alternative views. And of course, one of those alternative views was yours. Uh, and if we look at the next paragraph, Mr. Johnson says that he, he thought we put all the scientists through their paces. He says that by this point, he had a much better understanding of the data and evidence, and he certainly thinks that he was able to probe the different points of view that were being presented. And he says he was willing to be persuaded by the lockdown sceptics. But then this, he says he found that in reality, they, that is you, were reluctant to argue any such case, or not very hard. When pressed, the so-called dissenters actually seemed to agree with Sage's position and did not present anything compelling to make me think it was sensible to change his approach. Is it right that at the meeting you more or less agreed with the SAGE approach? Well, that's the interpretation of the then Prime Minister. It is, which is why I'm asking you whether you agree with The it. approach at that time was a tier system, which I can't, I don't know if that's what SAGE was proposing. Did you agree with the tier system? Yes, I did at that moment in time, because it was a much better alternative than to the zero COVID suppression argument that was being put on the table, which was to get the cases below a 1,000 and keep them there. In terms of looking at the tier system, what that was attempting to do was trying to find a middle ground between the two positions and match what was going on in Sweden, which was not an approach that did nothing. It was an approach that was responsible and managed it so, for instance, as I've said previously, with certain interventions, but minimised the disruption to society, or trying to get your maximum attempt in terms of reducing the impact in terms of disease outcomes. Yes. Now, Professor, in the course of his evidence earlier today, um, Professor Edmonds made various statements uh, about you and about mm. um, the, uh, about the uh, contribution that you made to the meeting and mm -hmm. I'd like to give you a chance to respond to them. Um, th there were three points. First of all, he, uh, or rather we looked at an email between him and Dame Angela McLean where they described uh, the approach that you and I think Professor Gupta were taking at the meeting as half-baked nonsense. Uh, we looked at a WhatsApp message sent by uh, Dame Angela McLean during the meeting where there was a reference to a fuckwit uh, and Professor Edmonds, I think, inferred that that was probably a reference to you. Uh, and he also said today that he thought you didn't understand basic epidemiology. Um, mm. What are your reflections on, on, on that evidence that the inquiry has heard? I would never, in a professional capacity, use such language about other individuals. 
It is not unusual to find yourself in disagreement and a position of disagreement. We call it uncertainty. And the job of an evidence-based approach is to try to reduce uncertainties so that you can make an informed decision. The very fact that you have opposing views shows you that there's a problem within the interpretation and the understanding of the evidence. But it also shows me a position of that sort of language would mean I would become resistant to any other viewpoint or discussion. And I think that's unhelpful. And it goes back to why were we brought in in the first place, is to try and propose a viewpoint that obviously was not being aired in SAGE, was not being aired in any point of the government advice, despite the fact I'd been working for the World Health Organization, I'd given evidence to the Irish Parliament, I spoke to a number of MPs outside of the Cabinet Office, and I said we did the work for the World Health Organization. So to be clarified and classed at that, I, I, you know, just goes to probably the heart of the problem here. Because one should always have an open viewpoint about alternative views. It is, you know, the idea that a statement could provide all of the answers is, is, is not something that you would recognise. But what it was proposing was an alternative view, how you might look at the, uh, the, the issues, how you might develop an evidence base and test some things. You have to, just as we were doing with drugs, and in doing so, come to a difference of what the current strategy was. In the round, I think it's fair to say that everything that we were proposing and the way we were looking at the epidemiology, remembering up to that point, we'd established clearly that many faults in the data as an epidemiological team. We also would be, and I would be very, uh, the, the idea we would, so one of the evidence-based approaches, we would be looking at the data, trying to understand what was happening. What I found very difficult was a modeling approach, which kept looking into the future and saying, this is what we now predict, with some certainty. And what comes with certainty is a reluctance to engage in the discussion and the debate. Professor, um, thank you. Uh, we've seen the contribution you made at mm. that time, and those are all the questions I, I have for you. And uh, there are no questions from CPs, my lady. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Hennigan. I'm sorry we haven't had more time, but I think Mr O'Connor's explained. If there are the matters that uh, you wish me to explore, by all means submit them in writing, and I will consider them. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Maybe that uh, concludes the evidence for today. Right. Well, um, we're now at a position where we're going to take a break from the hearings and return on 30th of October? Is it Monday? The, it's the Monday week. It's week. <laughs> week on Monday. Um, when I say we're taking a break, um, I'm afraid it doesn't mean that we're taking a break from work. I know that the inquiry team and the core participants teams will all be working enormously hard to ensure that we're ready for the next phase of the hearings. And there's also a great deal of work going on uh, as far as other aspects of the inquiry is concerned. So I'm afraid it's not a holiday break. It's a break from the hearings solely. So thank you all very much indeed. And for those who wish to follow the proceedings, either in person or online, Monday the 30th of October. Thank you, my lady. At 10.30.